December, a story about burning my bed by Damon Smith, narrated by Mr. Hey Now. Preface. My Uncle Percy used to tell me all the time when I was a kid that yesterday is gone and tomorrow will never come. I heard that shit so many times that I started using it in my everyday conversation before I really knew what he meant by it. By the time I finally got the gist of what he was saying to me, my uncle was dead, I was well into adulthood, and unfortunately working on my second term of incarceration. But that was before I started Fresh Out ENT, before I stopped living the street life, before Ed and Jean passed, and before I found myself sitting in my own personal two-bedroom t-shirt shop finishing an order for an out-of-state customer. I wonder who that is, I thought to myself as my personal phone vibrated in my lap. The thought crossed my mind and ignored the notification like I had done the countless ones before it, but curiosity got the better of me. W.Y.D. read the text from Keisha. Several thoughts ran through my mind as always before responding to her, but since her message was already on scene, I text back what I was literally doing and she laughed at me. I couldn't figure out what was so funny, so I text back a few emojis of my own, and just as I figured, her next message ended with the sex emojis. Here we go with that bullshit. I know by this time you're probably wondering who the fuck Keisha is. So let me give you the quick backstory. I met Keisha when I came home from prison the second time. She was the crazy girlfriend of a nigga that I was locked up with. But after he went back to jail for straight goosing on a weekday, she went through the three C's that came with my past occupation. Customer, conversation, then concubine. Reference loud or strong story, 0.5. Due to the fact that me and her dude was cool when I was in the joint, when I finally did become receptive to her advances, I promised myself that I would never make love to her for two reasons. The first being that I knew her dude personally, and the second, if he did ever find out that she gave me that pussy, I was going to be sure that I earned everything that came with it. Do not judge me. That's really neither her nor there, though. So when I finished with the last order of the day, I noticed that the date was December 2nd as I unlocked my phone to respond to her message and take pictures for the Fresh Out ENT of Pearl Instagram and Fresh Out ENT of Pearl Facebook page. The thought crossed my mind to have something else better to do with my evening. But the day before, I had talked to my cousin and decided on the title and what this book was finna be about. Hey Google, play Mr. Hey Now I called to my Google home as I read through the four text messages that she sent me back to back explaining what she had to do. Listening to myself playing off of the Spotify app as I packaged up my product for shipping made me feel some type of way about myself. I mean, in such a way. It also made cleaning up my mess a breeze too, as I put back everything where it was supposed to go, took out the trash and got the shop ready for the next day's business. By the time I got the text that she was pulling up, I had already ate, showered, and had nothing left on my agenda to do. Taking a few seconds to size her up as she locked her car and walked across the street, Keisha was 5'5", five, five, maybe 150 pounds with a caramel complexion. She was pretty in the face, had almost a handful of titties, and you could tell that she ran track in high school by how tight that ass was. I'm finna fuck the shit out this bitch, I thought to myself as I held the door open, welcoming her into my humble abode. You got some blunt she called over her shoulder as I followed her up the steps and joined the view of how that ass moved. Of course I do, I responded as I went left heading towards the kitchen and she went in the other direction towards my bedroom. They bring me a cup of ice she shot back. Walking down the hall with a cup in one hand and a pack of swishes in the other one, several things crossed my mind. When I made it back to my bedroom, the first thing that I noticed was that she had already made herself comfortable and was laying across the bed in boy shorts and a sports bra. That knocked the first thing off the list. The second was just for kicks and giggles on the front end. But on the back end, it was just to show how a woman would treat her nigga while he locked up. So while she scrolled through the Netflix looking for something to watch, I slid it in. You talk to my dude, I inquired as I passed at a blunts and set her cup on top of the footlocker next to my bed. You mean my husband, she shot back, turned the rapper open. Yeah, he keep asking me to get your number for him. She paused and made the weirdest little face. But for some odd reason, we always get off of the phone before that can happen. She laughed before getting out of the bed and making it her business to toot her little ass in her while she dumped the cigar guts in the trash can. They keep in mind this might be the last time you get to hit this pussy in real life, I thought to myself as I watched her rolling up the weed. 
And just for effect, I took my time to take out my T-shirt and basketball shorts before throwing them across the beanbag in the corner. Yes, I had a beanbag. Hoping I went three for three on my list when I got down to my polo boxer briefs and Captain America socks. I went and stood right in front of her with my hands on top of my head, making sure that the six pack was popping and my dick was right in her face as she was putting the last few licks on the rello. I kind of wanted to say something and she looked up at me, but before I could get the words to come out of my mouth, she had already took the bait and was rubbing her hand across the package. As it swelled at her touch, I was so thankful that her nails were done. Forgive me, but it's something about a woman holding a dick with her hands looking right to make it harder than usual. If you ain't never seen how I swell up in some polo boxer briefs, check the Fresh Out ENT porn hub and see for yourself. I got a few pictures on there for all the non-believers, but back to the story. By this time, my size and the fabric holding it in place was making for an uncomfortable situation. But she remedied that in excellent fashion by freeing them from its confines and putting them right in her mouth. I have to be honest with you, though. Having length and girth has its disadvantages, especially when it comes to receiving fellatio. So in real life, she didn't get a good two inches past the head before she started gagging. Eat that motherfucker, I instructed as I grabbed the size of her head and pulled her further down the shaft on her next attempt. I said in one of my Facebook Live videos that if a woman ever swallowed me whole while she was giving me head, that I would get her name tattooed on my side. I don't know why I said it. I swear for Lord I don't. But ever since I did, every time she got the chance, she shot a shot for that small piece of real estate. Doing my best to guide her to the goal, she gave it a few more good tries for the deep though, before giving up on that mission and breaking her fellatio down into sections. Head, shaft, and scrotum. Yeah, she sucked the nuts, too. I can't put a time limit on it, but that only lasted for a few more minutes before she let the dick go, laid back, and fired up. Where you get this from, I immediately questioned as she raised up to pass it to me. Mind you, my dick still hanging right where she left it at. My dirty people, she paused. What you think? Taking a few seconds to inhale, hold, then exhale, so I could completely taste the flavors of the weed, I wasn't impressed at all. It wasn't strange, though. For some odd reason, it was always like that with the weed that she fired up. If you were still hustling, I wouldn't have to deal with these mid-men. She cut back in before I could respond, and I damn near choked. That same thought forever crossed my mind, but a promise is a promise where my creator is concerned, and the thought died just as fast as it was resurrected. And the gene called it down, I paused to pass the blunt back. And that was that, I explained, before stepping out of my boxers and completely freeing myself up. Looking down at her while she smoked, she looked up at me and our eyes locked with each other. I can't say what she was thinking in that moment, but after our intimate stir ended, I took a few seconds to genuinely look her over from head to toe. And you wouldn't believe what caught my attention. Her ass was ash. The thought crossed my mind to say something, but ever since I met that man's wife and she brought coconut oil into my life, it has more uses than just in the kitchen. I stopped having a problem with ashy women. Since the weed was sub poor at best anyway, when she handed it back to me, I hit it one good time and passed it back to her before patting on her ass and telling her to take that shit off. The sports bra went one way and the boy shorts went the other as I exited the room in search of coconut oil just to find out that it had solidified and I had to throw it in the microwave for a few seconds to get it right. By the time I made it back to my room, she was asshole naked in the middle of the bed with her face down and her ass propped up. Just like I like her. This finna be one of them nights I thought to myself as I sat the jaw on top of the footlock after I poured the warm oil on her back and she moaned. I've been to the joint a couple of times, you'll have to forgive me. I'm so fucked up I actually put that same footlock in the video. You mad or not, but back to what I was saying. If you didn't read my first book, Loud or Strong Story 0.5, you wouldn't know. But just so you do, I'm kind of thorough when it comes to rubbing a woman down, so I ain't gonna bore you with the specifics of how that played itself out. But I will say that I made absolutely sure that her ass, pussy, inner thighs, nipples, and neck were all slippery when it was over and that I took my time to do it. That nigga gonna kill you, he find out you be wanting me to do this to you. I whispered into her cheeks as I pulled her to the end of the bed and stuck my tongue in her ass. But he don't do this to me, she moaned over her shoulder as she melted into the mattress. 
I read in the Jack book how the different movements of the tongue cause different sensations when performing cunnilingus. So you can only imagine the results I received when I took that same ingenious formula into analingus. It made me the triple threat, attentive, nasty, and long-winded. I swear for the Lord. Plus, it always made it easier to put my thumb in the ass later if I spit on it first. Is that raw enough for you? I'll make it even more interesting. I swear for the Lord, this story is based on a series of events that actually happened. I ain't gonna use nobody's real name in order to protect their privacy and to make sure I don't get sued on the back end, but I am gonna kinda stay true to the facts. You need three things to write a classic. A good title, a great subject matter, and some characters that you can relate to. I got all three, plus a few other things going on that's gonna make this a highly anticipated release. But let's get back to the story because Keisha comes back into play later on. My mother was the first person to ever tell me about being soul tied. I didn't understand it completely at first, but if Edna Jean brought it up, I always put a little effort into getting the understanding that she wanted me to have from me. She being the key word in that sentence. By loose definition, soul ties are a spiritual or emotional connection that you have with someone after being intimate with them, usually when engaging in sexual intercourse. To the point that when you want to be rid of them from your mental and physical, even when you are far away from them and out of their presence, you still feel as if they are a part of you and a part of you is with them. Causing you to feel unwhole as if you've given up some intangible part of yourself that cannot be easily possessed again. The second one I found just broke down soul ties as emotional bonds that form an attachment. They may be godly or ungodly, pure or demonic, depending on the person. There were so many other definitions and articles to go through, but they all basically broke down to the more women that you have sexual contact with, the more pieces that your soul gets broken into, and the more pieces of them you have to carry around with you to fill the void. That's deep. Confession time. I have to be honest with you, though. I ain't been whole since I was a teenager. I can't tell you how many women I had sex with in my lifetime. I can't even tell you how many women I had sex with since I came home from prison this time, and I do not blame the weed. I don't know if that makes me a bad person or not, but honestly, I don't feel no type of way about admitting it. As a matter of fact, I've done a lot of things in my life that somebody else is not going to be proud of, but I'm not going to feel any type of way about how they feel about it either. I can't take it back, and even if I could, I probably wouldn't because I completely understand what... Yesterday is gone and tomorrow will never come means. Now let me give you a little backstory on who I am right quick. As strange as this finna sound to the people that know me from my past life, I no longer play in the streets. I haven't sold a drug or took a prison chance in years because that was my mother's dying wish for me. And as I sit in my office 16 floors above the earth looking out the window at a beautiful view of the mountains in Denver, Colorado, I can honestly say that I made the promise in life to leave the streets alone and I am keeping it in her death. My government name is Damon Smith, but depending on where you know me from or where you met me at, I go by a host of nicknames and aliases. For example, as a kid, it was Edna Badass Son. As a teenager, it was Teddy Bird. In prison, it was Bur G or BG. And by the time that I got released for the first time after 14 calendar years, I had changed it to day. It was actually had my name day, but after trying to use it to push my music, I learned that the rights to the name day were already owned by somebody and that I either had to pay them to use it or I had to change it to something else. I can't tell you how that made me feel, but after putting some thought into it, I decided to go with Mr. Hey Now and you can find me on almost every streaming platform from iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, and Neurotic Media, the platform that distributes music to the Missouri prison system. I'm 43 years old, 6'1", maybe 190 pounds. I have no biological kids and I'm the owner of Fresh Out ENT. One word. If you don't know what that is, please take a few minutes out of your day and do your research so I won't have to keep explaining it to you. But for those that already know me, I write books, do music, make custom apparel, and I love my mother enough to change my life when that wasn't in my plans. Now with that out of the way, let me tell you about December. Chapter 1 I woke up the morning of December 3rd feeling some type of way about myself, I swear for Lord. 
I had met with my jeweler after I finished playing with Keisha to pick up my custom fresh out ENT pieces, and I couldn't wait to show them off. They do not get caught lacking the day I told myself as I got ready to slide into my morning Facebook Live video. It had come to my attention that I wasn't as single as I thought I was, so I took a few minutes to enjoy a cup of coffee and had that conversation with my audience. It covered a wide range of topics that crossed my mind as I spoke about leaving the city, getting a job, and selling everything that I wasn't taking with me when I left. I usually stayed live for about an hour between 8 and 9 in the morning because it served a couple of purposes. I don't know who Bright Idea was to start doing the videos, but they actually paid off in a way that made it make sense. It also gave me a chance to interact with my friends, fans, and followers, all at the same time so nobody to rock with me felt left out. On the back end, I figured out a way to sell any and everything that I could get my hands on through the Facebook platform, and that was the easiest way to keep in contact with the customer base that I already had and the new ones that I was picking up along the way with each hit of the share button. Sharing is caring. Random. You can only imagine the kinds of messages and phone calls that came with doing those videos. I could write a book just about that, just not this one. All I will say is that I entertained more than a few, and even more than that actually paid off. As a matter of fact, I know exactly who I got the idea from to start doing the live videos. And after I stopped by the post office to drop off the packages that I had going out, he was the next person that I ran into. I could tell you the whole rundown about who my fat partner is and how far we go back, but I'm not. He is one of them people that likes to maintain his anonymity, and I completely understand it. All I could tell you is that he owns a legal import-export business that deals in everything from shoes to appliances, and he been getting to a bag. Fat Pana, I got the silliest idea ever. I kicked off the conversation as I flopped down in the chair in front of his desk. What you got in mind this time, he shot back. Have you ever heard anything about being soul tired? I questioned. You would have to know my fat partner to understand that it literally took him a few minutes to respond. Like he was really thinking over the answer to the question or something. It took me a few months to get used to him doing that when we first met. But once I did, I stopped paying attention to it. He literally thought before he spoke. And that was a quality that I held him in high regard for. From what I know about it, it's considered a Christian thing. He paused and leaned back in his chair for effect. Something about being connected to the women that you have sex with. But you know me, I'm not big on religion like that. Why you ask? I did a little research on it myself, and I want to do something that a nigga ain't never did before I responded. And what would that be, he questioned. Fat partner, I want to burn my bed and invite every bitch that I knock down on it to watch. I pause just long enough to look at a text message on my personal phone. I'm trying to pull off the greatest act of transparency ever, I swear for Lord. There was a brief pause as we both grabbed our phones to respond to messages and notifications, as usual. It was always like that with our talks. Nothing stopped the business. Are you sure that's what you want to do? He started before giving me a laundry list of information that I would need to know if I really wanted to pull it off, including several things that I didn't even think about when I came up with the idea in the first place. Like it was against the law to burn anything within the city limits of St. Louis and St. Louis County without a permit. So what you think I should do about it? I questioned after he finished playing it out for me and opened the door for me to speak. Is you going to type it? Because that's the type of shit that'll go viral. He paused at the sound of a PayPal notification signaling a payment. And just between me and you, I have a piece of land outside of the city limits that you could throw a bonfire at. Huh? I replied, completely confused as to what a bonfire had to do with what I was talking about. And in true fat partner fashion, he broke it down for me that the legal, and yes, he used his fingers to throw up the quote signs, it was the cutest thing ever. Terminology for what I wanted to do was a bonfire, so there would be no need to get a permit or have any paperwork tied to it. He also brought to my attention that he had seen the fresh out ENT pieces on my Snapchat before ending with the question that everybody was asking me and I didn't really have an answer for. So where you going when you leave her? I don't know yet, Fat Pie Now paused to get up and shake his hand before turning to leave. But wherever it is, we gonna be legal. I finished before getting back in traffic headed to my next destination in life. 
I'ma just do it for Eddie Kane. Sad that he gone, he won't be the same. I see him every day, I'm in the city, cause you know I'm pulling up to his grave. I sung along with my song Tipsy, playing from the cars. I walked the road tombstones to get to his unmarked grave. I met Eddie Kane at the Missouri Eastern Correctional Center, aka Pacific, on my first bid, and he became like a brother to me. So much so that I was there when he came home, care package in hand, and he was there when I got married and when I got divorced. We might not have been related by blood, but he was one of the only people that I actually trusted enough to show exactly what I had going on at the time. It kind of be like that when you would split a pack of noodles with a nigga. A lot of weed, a lot of money, and more women than a regular I work a nine to five person could imagine. I can even remember at one point in time we made a bet on who could get their dick sucked the most by the blunt monkeys. Who killed them is still a mystery depending on who you ask. But his mother told me to leave it alone when I started to do my own research on it. And that's where I left it at. Don't get me wrong, though. The thought to get his lick back for him was a constant thought in the back of my mind. And one of the main reasons why I stopped by his grave almost every day. And to be completely honest with you, I got to get this off my chest. I kind of blame myself for his death. I wasn't there when it happened, nor do I know why it happened. But I do know for a fact that I introduced him to the lifestyle that he was living when it happened. It was the same one that I was living before I walked away from the streets. Loud, a strong story, 0.5. It came with death in jail. And due to the fact that I was still deeply embedded in the drug culture at the time of his passing, I can't tell you how many transactions that I actually made at the Free Cemetery in Baton just going to pay my respects. I had two more stops to make before taking it in for the evening. So after I finished talking to the dirt, I played no games getting from point A to point B. Have you seen me drive? For those on the outside looking in, it might not seem as bad as it really is. But if you pay attention to the murder rate, the double crosses, and the high-speed chases that have become a normal thing in the city, it might start making sense to you. On the flip side of the coin, I really know how real it is from first-hand experience. Cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, marijuana, pills, meth, codeine. I sold it all. I had done so much wrong when I was playing in the streets that when I finally walked away from them, I still moved around the city like I did. There were consequences and no statute of limitations on some of my past transgressions, and I always kept that in mind when I got behind the wheel of a car. Have you seen me drive? By the time I made it back to the house, I was right on time to catch Pop-Up TV, a podcast out of Texas. I had plugged in with them on the contest, ended up winning some money, and always got the shout out. So I watched them until Zen walked in the room. Hi, Day. She began walking right into my arms. Hi, Zen. I responded as I pulled her closer to enjoy her warm embrace. Did you get my text? She paused to open the cabinet to hear the coffee, cream, and sugar. What's on your mind? You want the truth or you want me to lie to you, I responded. You ain't got to lie to me, Day, she shot back. I know somebody wondering how Zen just walked in the room by now. So let me tell you why she get her cup together. I met Zen when I first started selling t-shirts. She was a 5'8 red bone with thick thighs and no ass. But what she lacked in the back, she more than made up for in the front. With breasts, beauty, and brains. Both of them. We enjoyed the season together and parted ways close friends with the option of benefits. Key to the house and new sexual term included. I want to burn my bed for the new year and invite every woman that I knock down on it to watch. I explained more animated than I needed to. Is you out of your mind? She paused to grab a paper towel. One of them girls is going to kill you, day. Wipe. What's wrong with you? Wipe. Why would you want to do that, day? Wipe. I am not coming, so don't ask she finished as she cleaned up the mess that I had caused her to make because she spit out the coffee before responding. But you gave me towel head on that bed, I shot back. You have to be there, I pleaded, just to see if I could go two for two on the shock value, but that didn't move her. No day. I will not be in attendance, she laughed. But who you in love with this week, she finished with a shot of her own. It caught me off guard for a second. And not because I didn't have an answer for it, but because I couldn't remember who I told her the last time she asked me that exact question. 
That man wife, I admitted, bracing myself for her response. You know you wrong, Day, she began before going into a long and drawn out rant on the subject. I can't tell you how many times we had that conversation, but she never approved and not one of them. Zen was big on the sanctity of marriage, and even more so with me because she knew that I had been married before and the reason why I got divorced. Cheating. Forgive me, ex-wife. Nothing I had to say in my defense moved her in any type of way, and believe me, I tried. I had no win with her on the subject, and every time it came up, she made it her point to make it a point that I knew her stance where Taylor was concerned, regardless of if I knew her already. I had a few orders to knock off, so after she finished telling me about myself, she helped me get them done while we smoked the blunt and caught up from the last time she graced me with her presence. After I watched her get in her car to leave, I jumped right on social media with the bullshit. Losing my mother had left a hole in me that nothing could feel, and every time $2 Tuesday rolled around, I felt some type of way that I wouldn't get the chance to politic with my creator. I had recently suffered through the year anniversary of her passing, and my mood soured every time a thought of her crossed my mind. Going through boxes of inner jeans, belongings, and smoking blunts back to back, time got away from me. I was holding on to so many grudges from past trials and tribulations that it was well into the afternoon before I realized that I had not been to sleep yet. I can't tell you how many inboxes and personal messages that I had missed in the process, but most of them were to check on me and see how I was doing. They knew what the day was and how much it meant to me. I had so much on my mind, instead of allowing people to tap in with me on Facebook, I took it straight to the YouTube platform for one of my 10 minutes of real talk with Mr. Hey Now videos just to get some of it off of my chest. Dressed in all black from head to toe, customary funeral attire. I did my best to put all of my grudges to rest. Carrying them around with me was getting me nowhere in life, so I kind of laid them out so I could let them go. Friends, family, acquaintances, and whoever else I may have felt wrong by. I had to admit to myself that it was my fault for dealing with them in the first place. And before I continued to point the finger at others, I had to point it at myself and forgive myself for all of the nonsense. Forgive myself for dealing with people that wasn't good for me. Forgive myself for doing things that wasn't in my best interest when I did them. Forgive myself for being ignorant to situations. Forgive myself for putting myself in places and dealing with people where I seen things that I had no business seeing. I had finally decided to take full responsibility for the part that I played in any and every situation that happened in my life. It was the easiest way that I seen to let them go and move forward by simply taking the weight. By the time I finished the video and fired up, I actually felt better. It was like a weight had been lifted up off me, and I took it right to a stat that read, after I let all of my grudges go, I feel 10 pounds lighter. I knew they was some bullshit and my phone started ringing. I wasn't really in the mood to talk about anything that I posted on any form of my social media, but I entertained the three calls and five texts. Then responded with another stat that read, I want a woman to jump when I say jump, not ask me how high. You couldn't imagine the responses that I received from that one, but it came with the territory. One day, my mother broke down for me the difference between the women that I dealt with and the women that I was supposed to be dealing with in the terms of jumping. I didn't understand it at first, but in true Edna Jean style, she played it out for me in a way that I couldn't miss the lesson, even if I tried to. The women that I dealt with, when posed with the request to jump, would at best respond, how high? In my childish mind, I thought that was a win and had been taken for one on a previous occasion. But after hearing her rationale to the request, it changed my whole perspective on the subject. Because come to find out, the women that I was supposed to be dealing with when posed with the request to jump would do just that. Jump. No response other than leaving her feet was acceptable in that situation because it wasn't a question. I don't know what I'm going to do, Edna Jean. I thought to myself as I opened another box of her belongings to see what I could throw away and what I wanted to keep. I ended the night with one final stat that read, I had to stop praying and start the proper preparation that prevents poor performance because that is exactly how I was feeling at that moment. Chapter 2 
You ever woke up later than usual to a bunch of missed calls and messages all because you didn't go live on Facebook at a certain time? I have. Have you ever had complete strangers know more about you and what you got going on than the people that you seen on a regular basis? I have. I've seen all kinds of things in my real life that most people wouldn't believe. And I wouldn't expect them to, by the way. But social media showed me every day that I hadn't seen as much as I thought I had. I can't be this important, I thought to myself, as I brushed my teeth and scrolled through all the messages that came when I didn't pop up to do my usual cock and coffee show. Don't ask. Believe me, the title wasn't my idea, but it worked. Both things played into what my audience was looking for for me and what I had to offer them in return. So much so that when I finished getting myself together, I slid in late just to thank a few of my followers for the love. You should have seen some of them messages. My first stop when I got outside put me right in front of Tory Reels, the owner of the Relevant Hair Gallery. And when I say this lady was worth looking at, I swear for Lord, she reminded me of one of the basketball wives from a distance, body modifications included. But up close and personal, she was a driven businesswoman set on building her brand and not letting anything get in the way of it. Her was her drug, and anything connected to it you could find at her one-stop shop. She was setting up to have a commercial shop to promote her business, and guess who was there to take everybody order? Me, that's who. You might not know how hard it is to make up your mind when ordering custom apparel, especially for a video shoot, but let's just say I was there for a while. Nobody really knew what they wanted, and everybody wanted something different. Four beauticians, two barbers, a couple loyal customers, an eyelash tech, and a partridge in the pear tree. I mean, Unc, her business partner. I don't remember exactly what I posted on my social media while I was there, but I do know for a fact that I was looking at Eddie Kane's grave when I got the message from Taylor about it. Have you ever been broken up with via a text? It's so impersonal. It don't matter how you read it. I know for a fact because I'm known for it. So it took me a few minutes to get my wording together to deal with the Catch-22. I had so much that I wanted to say, you couldn't imagine. But I knew that if I said too much, I'd lose. I also knew that if I didn't say enough, I'd still lose. So after running it past Eddie Kane, I hit sin to hope for the best. I know you're probably wondering who Taylor is and why she's breaking up with me via a text, and I can't wait to tell you. But first, let me tell you that it wasn't the first time that it happened. Taylor was 5'11", 180 pounds, with the smoothest mocha complexion I have ever seen in my life. Our first time meeting, I sold her a book and something clicked. I can't even tell you what it was either. But what I can say is that I'm very big on energy, and hers was something that I had only seen a few other times in my life. It pulled at me in places that I didn't even know with her, and before I knew what I was really doing, I was actually interested in a married woman. With children, might I add. I didn't think I had a chance with her at first, though. But after our energy continued to bring us together, it finally happened. Don't get me wrong. She was not the first married woman I had the pleasure of dealing with. I do not have a number for you. But she was the first one that I actually wanted to take away from her husband and make my own. Hence the pet name, That Man Wife. We had been having what some would call an affair for more than a year. I call it something completely different, but don't get me started. Brains, beauty, a drive similar to my own, and she listened to my music, like quote lyrics verbatim. She was everything that I was looking for in a woman, other than the fact that somebody had already caught her and put a ring on her finger. And to be completely honest with you, that didn't even bother me, because I couldn't get enough of her. When I finished smoking my blunt and paying my respects, I was back in traffic responding to a few inboxes that I had ignored earlier in the day. A few other women in my life were curious about what me and Tori had going on and why I was showing off on my social media. I actually had two reasons, to be honest. The first was because she looked like a basketball wife, and she didn't have no problem sending a shout-out to the lifers. My cousin in love with her, and he ain't never met her. And second... She had a business that I was showing support through all my social media platforms. The craziest part about it was that at no point did I ever hit on Tori or even think about it. I was connected to half her family from playing in the streets, so she was like family to me without even knowing it. 
and still is. By the time I made it back to the house, Rose was there. And yes, she had a key too. Your best friend is always supposed to have a key to your house. How she became my best friend is another story altogether. All I can tell you now is that she was standing right next to me when Edna Jean took her last breath. And not because of our relationship, but because of theirs. She actually beat me to the hospital. After hugs and kisses, she let me know that she wanted me to put something on the shirt for her. So I handled that while we talked about what was going on in the world and she fixed me something to eat. Random. I do not know how to cook. Ask anybody that knows me. It's sad, I know, but it is what it is. That you know you need to watch what you be posting on social media. People be thinking you are talking directly to them, she advised me. But you know just because a stat applies to you doesn't mean that it was directed towards you, I responded. Yes, I know that, she paused. But how many inboxes have you received because of yours, she questioned. More than I could account, I answered, just as a notification popped up on my screen. And you wouldn't believe when I checked the message that that was exactly what it was about. I wanted to say something to her about it, but I kept it to myself. One, I didn't want to prove her point. And two, I didn't want to add fuel to the fire to keep the conversation going. By the time I finished with her shirt, she was finished with the food. So I ate while she finished telling me how she felt about the subject. And more importantly, what I needed to be doing about it. As usual. It was all good information, as usual. But it just went in one ear and right out of the other one, as usual. When I got finished eating, she washed the dishes, gave me three kisses and left. It was the strangest thing ever though, because as soon as she pulled off, Taylor responded to my message. Are you at home, read her text? Yes, ma'am, I quickly text back. Don't judge me. I beat her in a few minutes, she responded, and you wouldn't believe the first thing that popped into my head was that I had to go down the steps to open up the door for her. The thought also crossed my mind to ask her why she didn't keep the key that I gave her months before, but I already knew the answer. It had something to do with a young red bone with an oil fetish who shall remain nameless that I had taken a liking to and stopped answering my phone one day. I was truly preoccupied. She ended up dropping the key in the mailbox and wouldn't take it back afterwards no matter what I said to her. Hello, beautiful, I greeted her at the door. Hello, handsome, she responded as she stepped inside. I had all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of questions. But as I looked over, they all slipped my mind. The small, form-fitting black dress and heels that she happened to have on had my complete attention and wouldn't let it go. Let me suck your pussy, I questioned as soon as she was on the right step to make it make sense. Damon, why are you so nasty, she responded while at the same time allowing me to remove her panties. The thought crossed my mind to respond, but I didn't really have an answer. Most of the things that I did were off the top of my head, so I continued with my first spontaneous thought and got to work on tasting her in the vertical position. There was no need for any words to be said at that point, and that was right up my alley. My only issue with Kundalini standing up was that it wasn't as simple as laying down, I swear for a Lord. Plus, I had never tried it on the steps to my apartment before either. Rookie mistake, I know. But in my defense, the idea honestly never crossed my freaky little mind. Once it did, though, I was all for seeing what I could accomplish placing myself in the situation. And it was a dance. Point ballet. And she lifted and held her leg to allow me all access from the front. Straight tongue to clitoris action. It also came with her leg thrown over my shoulder at some points. And yes, she kept the lawn very well manicured. Port modern dance. As I turned to adjust to her adjustments. Licking and kissing her inner thighs as I dived in and out at a few different angles to suck and nibble. You had to see it. Port pole dancing. As she used the rail and wall to maintain a good sense of balance. She stayed upright the whole time as I pulled her down on my face to get my tongue deeper inside of the creases and crevices that made up her tunnel of life. Poor reggaeton, as her hips twist and turned, she enjoyed getting her salad tossed, and I didn't have one issue tossing it for her. I ate her groceries like every time might be my last time, because I knew at some point that it would be. Poor tango, as she held me and allowed herself to be held, I slowly sucked and rimmed the inner folds to the entrance of her God quality 
and the other hole lingering on the space in between them. It's called a perineum. And poor improvised as I tried whatever came to mind that I hadn't tried before. I can't put a time limit on how long my reverse kiss lasted, but I can say that it wasn't a quickie. Leg up, other leg up, flat footed, from the back, from the front, from the side, and every other angle that I could get to her without it making my neck hurt in the process. Is it just me though? But right after I finished eating her up, I had to kiss her right in the mouth preferably with a little tongue action. On the front end, I wanted her to taste herself the same way that I tasted her because that freaky shit turns me on a little bit. On the back end, it ensured that even the anger of disagreement that what happened would never come up. Whether I blew in her booty or stuck my whole tongue in her ass, it would stay between us. Forgive me, but one of my exes brought that up in a public argument about how I ate a whole asshole but completely left out the fact that I tongue-kissed her right afterwards. But that's another story. And for the trifecta, it was also a great way to transition into a different position or move from one room to another. By the time we made it all the way up the steps, she was only wearing the heels, and it was the sexiest shit ever. I hadn't really paid attention to the dress of bra once we got started, but I did see them out of the corner of my eye on the floor as we kissed down the hall towards the bedroom. Random. There was a security camera at the top of the stairs always set on motion to take the mold, and the playback footage was amazing. Don't let her get away from you, day I told myself as I kiss broke and I twisted her around to the position that I was looking for before releasing her onto the bed. Face down, ass up. Toot that motherfucker up, I instructed as I dive back in to taste her from the back again. Yes, she responded, following those instructions to the letter. I know this is probably going to sound strange to somebody, but that's part of my setup when I start the penetration from the back. I've noticed that it has a very desirable response when you enter her after licking, spitting, and stimulating it first. Add to that the fact that I have great stamina to go along with my size, and I have the complete set of ingredients to truly satisfy a woman. When my mother first found out that I was involved with Taylor, because I told her as soon as I got involved with Taylor, she wanted to know was I really giving her the business or was I taking it easy on her. I wanted to lie to moms about it, but when I couldn't, I gave her the truth on how I was doing everything in my power to make the lady mines and mines only. More than a year later, as I ran her through every position that I could think of at the time, I was still on the same mission. One day it's going to happen, I thought to myself as I held her close to me afterwards. I can't tell you how many times I tried to get her pregnant or how many times I begged her not to leave me or how many times I literally tried to suck the life out of her, but none of it worked. No matter what I tried, when I opened my eyes after falling asleep with her in my arms, she was always gone. I ain't never told nobody this before, but that hurt me in a way that words couldn't explain. And this situation was no different. I thought I might have had the chance to see her as the first thing that I seen when I opened my eyes in the morning, but that was not the case. It was only 3 o'clock in the morning when I checked the time, and she was already gone, as usual. Don't get me wrong, though. I completely understood why she couldn't spend the night with me. She had a family at home to look after, children to see off to school, a husband to wake up with per their vibes, and a few other things going on. But none of that mattered to me. I also knew that it was super selfish of me to ask that of her, knowing her circumstances, but I couldn't help myself. Her energy was a drug to me that I couldn't get enough of no matter what I did, and I was willing to do almost anything to get more of it. Maybe next time I told myself as I took my thought to a Facebook stat that read, why am I still up? And you wouldn't believe that she was the first person that responded to it. I couldn't do nothing but laugh at it because the tears never came when I wanted them to. Chapter 3 Where you at, they read the text from Destiny. The thought actually crossed my mind they ignored it, but I didn't follow it. I responded with my current location, which happened to be leaving the cemetery after paying my respects and running a couple of my ideas past Eddie Kane. You got any food in the house? Or do I need to stop and get some before I pull up? She questioned in her response. 
What you mean pull up, I take back. Confused as to how that was even possible because she didn't live in St. Louis. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but doing those live videos came with all kinds of inboxes and messages. I can't remember at exactly what point Destiny came into my life, but I can say for a fact that she came from one of those messages that I should have ignored, but I didn't. I don't know if anybody that knows me knows this, but I'm not from St. Louis, nor do I claim it to be my place of birth, though it's where I'm from. I was born in Kansas City, Missouri, and until I turned 15, I lived in between the two places. That's neither here nor there, though. But what is important is that that's where I actually met Destiny after attending a funeral for one of my uncles once I got back in contact with my father's side of the family after a 25-year hiatus. Destiny was 5'5", 145 pounds, with a cappuccino complexion. She had the perkiest set of double deep breaths that I had the opportunity to wrap my hands around, and the rest of her body was semi-proportionate to go along with her pretty face. I entertained her advances from a distance for months before I actually found myself in the city of my birth again to see what she was really talking about. Our first official meet and greet played itself out like a scene out of a movie, and I kind of got locked in from that moment. I wasn't sure if that's where I was supposed to be at the time, but I went with it without putting too much thought into it. I didn't have the slightest idea what I was doing either, and to be completely honest, I thought it was a setup at first. It was too good to be true. So much so that I wasn't in her presence for more than a few hours before she had fed me, enjoyed a shower with me, and was riding me to sleep. But that was before all the nonsense came into play. I didn't know it at the time, but I found out the hard way that she was truly mentally disturbed, and I had become the focus of her attention. I had dealt with so many women throughout my lifetime that I hadn't paid any mind to being stalked by a woman. But let me tell you, I found out quickly enough dealing with her and the shenanigans that came along with it. But let me get back to the story. Not knowing if she was playing or not with her questions, I let her know about the food situation at my residence while I made a few stops to drop off items that had already been paid for. I actually thought she was on her usual trip with me. When she said she was on her way, you would have to know that she lied a lot. But as I turned to take the back way that led to my house, I got the text that she was pulling up and it threw me for a loop. Our last interaction came with all kinds of name calling, messaging other women that I dealt with, false accusations about my sexual preferences, and my personal favorite she played on my phones for about 36 hours straight. Now look what you done got yourself into, day. I thought to myself as I pulled over on the side street to see if she was truly serious about pulling up or was it just another piece in playing the game that came along with dealing with her? And I didn't have to sit long to find out. I'm here, read the text from her at the same time as I watched her park across the street from my house, and you couldn't imagine the thoughts that ran through my mind. The first one was that I should pull off and act like I wasn't near my house, but that didn't last long. Destiny was the type to sit there until I decided to come home anyway, and I wasn't in the mood for that. Second, I thought about actually leaving town right at that moment so I wouldn't have to deal with her. But that went out the window just as fast because I wasn't packed for such a trip and it wouldn't be any way possible to get past her and into my apartment without her seeing me. That one way in, one way out shit. Several other bright ideas crossed my mind also before I gave up on trying to get out of dealing with her and just decided to face my fears. Here I come, I responded before bending a couple of corners so I could pull up and she never knew I was watching her. Drug dealer tactics. I had to be honest, though. When I did finally pull up, I sat in the car for a few more minutes still contemplating if I wanted to be bothered with her at all. Destiny had a way of rubbing me the wrong way without even trying to, and I couldn't even explain it. I could deal with all the other things about her that I didn't like, but her words, when directed along the right subject matter, cut into me like a knife, and that pain was not something that I felt like dealing with. Not then, or ever for that matter. High day, she greeted me with groceries in one hand and her overnight bag in the other. What's the word, Destiny? I responded before opening my door, relieving her of the bags, and watching her go up the steps. Always the gentleman, <laughs> and that ass look good. After watching her make herself at home, I jumped right in with a few questions that had been eating at me since the last time we had spoke. 
Can you tell me why you told Taylor I was gay? I questioned with nothing but irritation in my voice. Because I wanted you all to myself, she paused to give me her forgive me for acting out look. I only know because I had seen it before on more than one occasion. Plus she married and she ain't finna leave her husband for you. Cut like a knife. Well, why was you sending messages and screenshots to everybody else then, I inquired, just to see what her response would be. And you wouldn't believe her comeback left me stuck for a split second. Because I love you, Day. We need to just get married. You should move to Kansas City with me so we can start a family, she began before going into a long and draw out spiel about what I meant to her and how much we were supposed to be together. Don't get me wrong, though. It wasn't the first time me and her had that conversation. The only catch was, I was still in the same place in life I was when it first came into play, and I wasn't any closer to seeing her point of view on the subject. The only thing that always piqued my interest was that she didn't have any children, and I always wanted one of my own more than anybody could ever know. I touched on a couple of other things that had happened since she went on her social media spree to ruin several of the relationships that I had going on at the time. But since none of it worked, I was really kind of over it at that point. I knew who I was dealing with and almost everything that was going to come with dealing with her, or already had. I hadn't paid any attention to what the date was, but I got it locked into my memory as soon as she said that she started ovulating on the 8th, which happened to be the exact date. This motherfucker lady talked too much, I thought to myself, as she began cooking and the conversation continued. I wasn't really in the mood to deal with her being loquacious. But as soon as I fired up the blunt that I was rolling while I suffered through the first part, the sound of her voice kind of died out, and it was a blessing. I had a couple of orders to take her of, so after we finished eating, I got her settled in my bedroom, then took her of the business in in the fully functioning t-shirt shop that took up what was supposed to be my living and dining room. It didn't take as long as I wanted it to, and stalling was never really something that I was good at. So when I finished, I ended up smoking another blunt, taking a shower, and doing my best to fall asleep on her as soon as she started back talking about us. I had no intentions of entertaining her nonsense on the subject, so when I couldn't take it anymore, I went with what I knew would work to shut up. Put this in your mouth, I demanded as I pulled my dick out and grabbed the back of her head, pulling it towards my crotch. For some odd reason, sex was the only time that she didn't want to talk, and I took full advantage of it. I also tried my best to take advantage of the fact that she was ovulating. So at the end, after doing everything that I did to her, I made my deposit right where it might do me some good later on in life. I don't know what time we woke up, but it was well into the afternoon and I had missed all types of calls and texts. I didn't usually turn my ringers off, but at some point during the night, I got tired of listening to them ping and ding. I had a couple of runs to make to handle some odds and ends with me leaving, so after I got myself together, I started dealing with everything that I had missed while I was asleep. And you wouldn't believe what the first thing was that I noticed when I looked out of my front window before opening the door. It was Taylor Park right in front of my rental and it put a pause in me for a second. I hadn't even noticed that she left me a message saying she was pulling up. But I seen it finally as I walked up to her car to see why she had graced me with her presence unannounced. You know, this would have been a great time for you to have your key, I joked after she let down her window and gave me the strangest look. I'm not taking that key back, she paused to look me up and down, and you know why. The thought crossed my mind I had that conversation with her again, but common sense prevailed. I actually had somewhere that I needed to be, so we chatted for a few seconds before I hopped in the car and pulled off. I wasn't sure if she knew that Destiny was at my house at the time, and I wasn't about to stand outside talking to her to give either one of them the chance to run into each other. Forgive me, but I wanted no parts of them finally meeting face to face. By the time I made it back to the house, Destiny was up and moving around. Taylor knew something wasn't right about me not answering my phones or responding to her messages. But her thoughts were directed on the young red bone that I had been dealing with, so it made it easy for me to deny the accusation truthfully to put her concern to rest. Day, can we talk? Destiny question breaking me from the days that I was in looking at my text messages. What's on your mind, love? I responded. I want to tell you something that I've never told anyone before. She paused to sit on the bed. It has been on my mind for a while and I want to get it off my chest. 
Here we go with this bullshit, I thought to myself. But I played along and sat on the footlocker next to the bed to give her my full attention. Talk to me, love, I finally responded. Day last year, I was at work doing what I normally do. She paused to adjust herself on the bed, and the call light came on from one of my hospice patients. The lady didn't have no family and was losing her battle with multiple sclerosis. The thought crossed my mind to cut her off right there. But before I could get the words to come out of my mouth, she continued. I answered the call, and it was the worst condition that I had ever seen her in. She was already paralyzed from the chest down, and looking at her later did something to me that I couldn't understand. I wanted to help her in any way that I could, but the doctors had already informed everybody working our unit that she had a DNR, do not resuscitate order in her file, and that it would only be a matter of time before her body completely shut down. They tell this bitch to shut up, I told myself, but nothing came out of my mouth. It was like I was stuck and couldn't move. She took another deep breath and continued talking. I could actually see the pain in her eyes as she looked at me, but she didn't speak. They had put her on a breathing machine the day before, and that was the only sound that could be heard in the room she paused. It was unsettling for real, but there was nothing that I could do about it. All kinds of thoughts were running through my head at that moment, but nothing came out. I had seen this same scene with my own mother laying in a hospital bed fighting her last fight with multiple sclerosis, and I couldn't get the visual out of my head. I was rarely ever at a loss for words, but this was one of those moments. Day, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say either. Nothing that came to mind was fitting to the situation, so I just stood there at her bedside holding her hand and praying that she find peace. Shut up, I screamed in my mind, but not a sound came out of my mouth. I had never told anybody what happened the day I lost my mother, but as she continued to tell her story, it was the same one that I had lived in real life. And though I was physically at my house sitting on my footlocker listening to her talk, Mentally, I was right back in the room standing over my guy watching her struggle to live all over again. It was the scariest thing I've ever had to witness with my own eyes, and it only got worse as time passed. It started off with her shaking uncontrollably. Then her nose started bleeding and I went for help. She paused to readjust herself again. When I came back with the doctor on duty, thinking that he would do something to ease her pain, I found out that there was nothing that could be done. He actually told me that I could leave, but I couldn't force myself to do it. She didn't have anybody else in the world that cared about her enough to be there in her time of need, and I refused to follow suit. I still couldn't move. Words still refused to come out of my mouth, even though I didn't want to hear another word of her story. Everything inside of me was fighting to take back control of my body, but nothing was working as she looked at me for some form of a response. And when I didn't have one, it just gave her the room to continue. I was passed by like they were minutes, and I was right there for all of them, telling her that it would be all right, telling her that she was not alone. The oxygen that was being given to her was so pure that it was drying her out and causing her nose to bleed uncontrollably. I don't know how many times I wiped her face to remove it, but it continued to flow no matter what I did, and I couldn't stop myself from doing it. You couldn't imagine how I felt on the inside. I knew exactly what she was talking about because I had done the exact same thing. The only difference between her story and the one that I had lived was that I wasn't alone in the room when it happened. Rose, my mother's other son, and my aunt were all present at the time, but I still felt like I was all alone. I even wrote a poem in a moment to express the way that I was feeling, and the words played out in my mind like I was right back there watching it happen. Watching my mother struggle for breath. I can't say how strong I am. They giving her air. I just want to hold her hand. I just want to tell her I love her and know that she understand. I just want to tell her the truth because this wasn't in my plans. I know that it's coming for her. I know that she'll go to war. I know that my daddy are waiting for her at heaven's door. Man, it's been so many wars. Man, it's been so many fights. Man, it's been so many days. Man, it's been so many nights. Love her so I gotta watch. I can't even look away. Eyes open, glasses off. I'ma have to look today. Watch the pain, knowing it ain't nothing I can do about it. Watch her pain, 
knowing it ain't nothing I can do about it. Really think I want to cry, but I can't even find the tears. I can't even find the tears, because I've been watching this for years. When Destiny finally got to the part of the story where the lady took her last breath, I was finally able to move. I didn't know what had happened to me, and I didn't want to know. All I knew was that I had not mourned my mother's passing since it happened, and that I had been doing everything in my power to keep the thoughts out of my mind. The thought crossed my mind to tell her that she had played out the experience that I had experienced losing my God, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. Anger was the only emotion that I could find in that moment, and it showed as soon as I found words to express myself. Get the fuck out my house, I commanded as I got up and grabbed her by the arm. What I do, Day, she questioned with the strangest look on her face. You have to go, and I mean right now, I explained as I grabbed her belongings and escorted her to the door. She tried to resist for a split second, but after looking at the look of complete rage on my face, she stopped talking and walked with me without saying another word. When I finally got out of my residence, I locked the door and sat on the steps. I had so many thoughts on my mind about what had just happened to me that I sat there for several hours unable to move. I searched for tears. I looked deep inside of myself for some form of an emotion that could explain how I was feeling, but I couldn't find one. There was nothing there to be found, and I completely understood why. I ain't never told nobody this, but I gotta get it off of my chest finally. I couldn't mourn my mother because I prayed for her death. I literally begged for her to be taken out of her misery because I was tired of watching her suffer. It was the hardest thing that I ever had to witness in my life, but it gave me some form of peace on the front end. But on the back end, it left a hole in me that nothing could ever feel. It kind of be like that when somebody has been in your life since your first breath. I was just glad that I was able to be there for her last. Chapter 4 December 11th started off like any other $2 Tuesday. I slid into my morning live truly caught up in my feelings. Only two days had passed since I escorted Destiny out of my residence, and the thoughts of what had happened were still fresh in my mind, though I kept them to myself. Cock and coffee went just like it was supposed to, and I caught a couple of out-of-state orders for my time. I wasn't sure whether they were spending money with me to support my cause or if they had other intentions for me. But either way, I accepted the payments and got the shirts together. It took my mind off of what was really bothering me and took Kira graced me with her presence. It was always easy to tell when she came through the door because all that ass made a distinctive sound coming up the steps. Allow me to explain. The first time I met Kira, I happened to be shirtless and it must have caught her attention. Our second meeting happened with her coming to the shop to get a few items customized and I finally got the chance to look at her. And you wouldn't believe what happened. I actually fell in lust. Curl was 5'4", 199 pounds, with a milk chocolate complexion. She was right on the borderline of being fat, but it was hard to tell because she was top and bottom heavy. Baby had titties and ass on her, I swear for Lord. She was pretty in the face and happened to have a set of soup coolers on her that made my knees weak. She worked right around the corner from where I live and always came by to spend her lunch with me when she didn't have anything else planned. But let me get back to the story. What you doing, she questioned as soon as she walked into the room. Nothing now, I responded, giving her the once over that always came with seeing her in person. Did I tell you she had titties and ass on her? I had all kinds of thoughts running through my head at the time, and the custom fucking mess sweater that she happened to be wearing didn't help the situation at all. It actually made it worse for a split second, but I did everything in my power to push the thoughts from my mind to concentrate on other things. Luckily, the black stretch pants that she happened to have on with it worked to do the trick without even trying. Some ladies at my job want some shirts made she started before giving me the rundown of what they wanted. When they want them, I responded. Today, if you can get them done, she paused to hand me the money they had given her to get the items done. I hope this enough. After counting the money and seeing that it was more than I would have charged them if they had asked me a price on the shirts, I put it in my pocket and got to work. Can you feed me, please? I questioned as I started turning on all my equipment to secure their payment. What you want, boy? She shot back walking into the kitchen to look in the refrigerator. Random. 
Cure had been in my life for over a year and did everything in her power to make sure I was all right. She cooked, cleaned, washed dishes, put food in the house, and anything else that I might need. She was the closest thing to a living girlfriend besides the fact that she didn't live with me. But she did have a key that she didn't have no problem using. So much so that she popped on one night that Taylor was there and made herself at home. But that's another story. Let me get back to telling you this one. I don't care, love. Just feed me, I answered. You always say that, she paused to give me her little look. You know the one where she rolls her eyes and kind of turns her face up? All women do it. I never knew what she meant by it, but I seen it so much that I kind of got used to it. The thought crossed my mind to explain to her my logic behind me not caring what she cooked, but I kept it to myself. I refused to have that conversation with her again because it completely went over her head the first time. Well, make it make sense for me. I finally responded after taking a second to return her little look with one of my own. Don't judge me. The pancakes, scrambled eggs with cheese, and turkey sausage got finished right around the time that my heat press signaled that it was ready for action. It didn't take another 15 minutes to get the shirts pressed, pictured, and packaged up for delivery. Boy, don't let that food get cold, she screamed from the bedroom a little louder than she needed to. What she didn't know was that I had already had plate in hand, and the only reason that I didn't respond to her because my mouth was full. The lady knew how to cook. Also, it didn't take long to get to the bottom of my meal because I still ate like I was in a joint. That eating on the time limit will change how you enjoy your food, and old habits are hard to break. After the plate hit the sink, I was headed to my bedroom to follow my first mind. I don't know if I said this earlier, but I lusted Kira. Take that shit off, I demanded as I walked into the room. You know I gotta go back to work, she shot back while at the same time following instructions. The thought crossed my mind to tell her how I really felt about her job, but I kept it to myself as I admired her body as the clothes came off. Her thick thighs with the weight proportionate derriere to compliment them was something that I couldn't resist, even if I tried to. The first time I actually seen her naked, I left all the lights on and enjoyed the view. I think it made her a little uncomfortable at first, but she played along like she was unbothered by it, and that was exactly what I was looking for. All those years away from society made me truly appreciate seeing a woman naked from all angles, especially if she had a body that was worth looking at. All this for me, I said to myself as I pulled her to the edge of the bed and entered her from behind. I don't know where exactly I got my manners from in the sexual department. But for some odd reason, I always smacked the pussy a couple times with the dick before penetration. I had been questioned about the purpose that it served on multiple occasions and what exactly it did for me sexually, but I really didn't have an answer. In my mind, you are always supposed to knock before you enter somebody's residence, and that was my rationale. Sliding in between the moist folds of her most precious possession, because I knocked first, was a feeling that words can't describe. It wasn't too tight to cause discomfort, but it wasn't too loose to make it not enjoyable either. It wasn't exactly dripping wet, but it was far from dry. It also happened to be exactly the right temperature with enough room to explore our insides, but not too much space to get lost. 15 strokes in, I pulled out just to lick around the rim of her sphincter because I knew that that did something to her. Not only did it cause her body to respond with a vibration that made her ass shake in the prettiest way, it also made her wetter than she already was. You so nasty, she moaned, as I spit in her ass again and used my tongue to swirl it around. But you like it, I shot back as I knocked on her door again before re-entering. No, I love it, she corrected me as she pushed backwards to meet my forward thrust. I can't tell you how it felt, but the view of me sliding in and out of her was amazing. Inch by inch, my third leg disappeared inside of her. Then inch by inch, it reappeared for me to look at, completely covered in a mixture of her first orgasm, my spit, and her natural juices. It was a sight to see. Stroke after stroke after stroke. I continued to press the issue in my exploration of her love tunnel. I don't know if it's a proven fact, or something that can be explained through science. But I have noticed that depending on what angle you enjoy a woman from, her pussy has different pathways and pockets that cause different sensations. 
There are also different combinations of movements and gestures that can be added to them to heighten the experience, like smacking her ass, giving her the thumb, massaging her breasts, pulling at her hips, and my personal favorite, sucking her toes. The thought crossed my mind to stay in the doggy style position until I found my climax. But as soon as I put my leg up to add pressure to the situation, she collapsed on the bed. Where you going, babe? I questioned as our doggy style evolved into the snake position. Nowhere, she moaned as she arched her back to allow me full access to another canal inside of her. Stroke after stroke after stroke. Stroke after stroke after stroke. Stroke after stroke after stroke. The deeper I got inside of her, the more she moaned and gave herself to me, grabbing and pulling at the sheets, cussing under her breath, and rotating her hips to give me even more access. The harder I thrust it, the more she submitted until I found the exact spot that I was in search of as her second or third orgasm made her body shake uncontrollably. When her tremors subsided, I adjusted her right leg and slightly turned her body to place her on her side so I could have her from a different angle. There was something about that position that made it easy for me to tap the bottom of her, and I took full advantage of it. Stroke after stroke after stroke. Stroke after stroke after stroke. Stroke after stroke after stroke. As I held her leg in just the right position to feel the head of my dick running into her cervix. This position also allowed me the opportunity to massage her breasts, which I took full advantage of as she held me around my hips with one arm and used the other one to throw one of the pillows off of the bed like it was in her way. I can't say how long that lasted, but what I can say is when I let her leg down, it was only to roll her over to enjoy her in the same position from the other side. The left leg up gave me a completely different angle at what I was doing, and you wouldn't believe that it even felt different. It actually caused her a little discomfort for some odd reason. So I took my time with the first several strokes to give her body a chance to get used to it. Stroke after stroke after stroke. Stroke after stroke after stroke. I had noticed early in our sexual relationship that she was not used to being flipped and turned and it threw me for a loop. Being ambidextrous gave me the option to work from whatever side I happened to be on and she got that work any and every time I got the opportunity to give it to her. Not to mention I had no problem pausing to taste her in between positions and that only made her legs shake more than I really wanted them to. By the time we got to missionary, the sweating was in full effect, making her a slippery situation to deal with. It didn't bother me at all though. As a matter of fact, as I held her legs up to ensure that she received every inch of the dick, I sucked her nipples to check her salt intake. Don't judge me. I hadn't been paying attention to the time, so when it crossed my mind that I had to take her back to work when I was finished, I gave her a short break while I got up to check my phone, only to see that she had 30 minutes before her lunch break was over with. I wasn't sure if I would get the chance to finish what I started, but I did give her another 25 or 30 good strokes before calling it quits. That gave her enough time to take a quick shower and get herself back together. I could tell that her legs were still a little weak as we left the house and it made me feel good about myself in such a way. But with arrogance always comes to fall and I didn't get halfway to her job before I had to buck a U-turn and go back to the house. Thinking about what I had done to the pussy made me completely forget about the shirts that I had made were still sitting on the table where I left them. That's what you get, she laughed as I handed her the bag after getting back in the car. When I got back to the house, Thoughts of Edna Jean was still heavy on my mind. Losing her was the worst loss that I ever had to face without her, if you get what I'm saying. I had also made $2 Tuesday our thing before her passing, and every time it rolled around, it brought back all those memories that I would never be able to recreate. Random. I have never told anybody this, but the time has come to get it off of my chest. When I found out that my mother had multiple sclerosis, I was talking to her on a prison call that she was paying for it. Baby always accepted. I didn't know what it was, but with all the time in the world on my hands, I did all the research that a correctional center library had on the subject just so I could know what she was dealing with. I was 22. The first couple of years, nothing about her really changed, but that was just the beginning. 
As I started knocking the years off my 20 year sentence, I got to watch the slow decline in my mother that I had read about. All the symptoms, all the mobility issues, and more importantly, all the side effects that they said came with the medicines prescribed to slow it down. Cause ain't no cure. I was six years into my sentence when her legs started to go. Ten years in when she finally gave up on trying to walk and hopped in a wheelchair. Twelve years in when she started losing the flexibility in her hands. By the time I finally made parole after 14 years, she was paralyzed from the stomach down and bedridden. Even more random. I'm not for certain that this is a fact, but I'm almost positive that the grudge my mother's other son holds against me is the fact that he was third through her decline while I was in the system doing time. He got to see it every day while I only got to see it on visits and at my parole hearings. When the day nurse that they sent to look after her wasn't enough, I went and found a nursing home to put her in that I was certain that she would get great 24-hour care. That did not go over well with the rest of her family. But I didn't pay them people no mind. I had already went to the nursing home to talk with the staff working her unit and the police got called. I didn't pay them people no mind either. Because all I said was, if my mother ever called me to tell me they were mistreating her, that I was going to kill everybody working her for letting it happen. They said it was a threat. I said it was a promise. And the message got passed down to every employee in the building and every new employee that got hired during her stay. When I was sure that she was in good hands, I got married, divorced, and right back to the street life. It didn't take a year before the feds kicked in, but it did take another 18 months before I got caught high speed and sent back to prison for another three years. Loud, a strong story, 0.5. That's neither here nor there. But what is important is that while I was doing that three-year sentence, the only thing that I prayed for at night was that I would make it out of prison before my mother took her last breath. Nothing else really mattered to me. Everything else in life that I ever wanted to do, I had already accomplished while I was on the run. Money, women, cars, clothes, jewelry, alcohol, the best marijuana. It didn't make a difference what it was. If I seen it and wanted it, I got it. And strangely, I got out of prison for the second time with the exact same attitude. Right back to the paper. I also got right back to the visits with my creator, the politic about life and everything else that I had going on. I rationalized my mother's condition with being in prison in her own body. And I owed her the same visits that she gave me in prison to make sure that she had snacks, money on her books, and whatever else she needed to make her stay comfortable. And that's where it happened. I don't know what I was thinking when I asked Edna Jean what her dying wish was, but I did. The question just kind of rolled off my tongue like any other, and I couldn't take it back once I said it. You should have seen the look on her face. The thought had never crossed my mind to walk away from the street light, so you could only imagine how I took it when that was her answer. I actually tried to bribe her to take it back, but that didn't even work. It was like that was the moment that she had been waiting on for me and I walked myself right into it. I could tell you the long version of how that played itself out, but I'm not. All I will say is that I broke my trap phone in the nursing home grass, and I haven't sold a drug or took a penitentiary chance since. And yes, it was a Tuesday. Don't get me wrong, though. The thought to pick that bag back up crosses my mind on a daily basis. The only reason I don't is because my word means more to me than anything that money could buy me. I'm stupid like that. When I came up with the idea for the bacon MSP, you couldn't imagine the responses that I received. An ex-drug dealing convicted felon collecting money for multiple sclerosis did not go over well at first. I almost wanted to give up before I ever got started, but Edna Jean wouldn't let me. She played it out for me how I could get the mission accomplished, and I got right to the business. It was a Tuesday. When I found out that she wanted to be cremated when she passed, it was a Tuesday. When she told me what she wanted me to do with her ashes, it was a Tuesday. When I came up with the bright idea of what I wanted to give her for her birthday, it was a Tuesday. I know this is going to sound strange if you don't already know me, but I had my mother's funeral while she was still alive to enjoy it. And after I got out of the shower and finished getting myself together, I smoked a blunt and watched it.
Then I watched it again. Then I watched it again. It was the only thing that I needed to see to get me back focused on what I needed to be doing regardless of how I was feeling. I had given my mother my word that I would do everything in my power to make sure that her memory lived forever. And watching myself saying it along with her response to it was all the motivation that I needed to get me through the rest of the day. I just needed to see it a few times for it to sink in. Chapter 5 By the time the 13th rolled around, I had cleaned out my storage unit and got most of the things that I wanted to get rid of gone from my residence. It either went in the trash or somebody came and picked it up. But either way, I was glad to have it out of my life. I have never been big on holding on to anything, and for some odd reason, it hurt to look at any of Edna Jean's belongings for too long. I wonder who that is, I said to myself, as I heard my phone singing to me as it rung. The thought crossed my mind and ignored it continued doing what I was doing, but since I wasn't actually doing anything but standing in my bedroom looking at the wall, I picked it up and answered the call. Hello? What you doing, Jelly's question? The next thought that crossed my mind was why I answered the phone in the first place, but that's not what I said. I didn't have anything going on at the time, and that was exactly the answer that she received. Let me come over, she shot back. Now before I go any further, allow me the opportunity to tell you who Jelly's is. I met Jelly's a couple days after I got put out of Sasha's house for whatever it was that I did at the time. I can't tell you because I don't remember. But what I will never forget was that she put my Xbox One out in the rain and it hurt me in such a way. Honorable mention for an ex, but back to the story. Jelly's was French vanilla complected in the true definition of a BBW. The only thing that really caught my attention was that she was pretty in the face with it, so I gave her a chance. I didn't have anybody to go home to anyway, so I figured why not. We ended up sleeping together the first night, but I did not hit that pussy. I slept with her the second night completely nude, but I did not hit that pussy. I slept with her on the third night, but I did not hit that pussy. We cuddled and talked and all that other good shit, but there was no sex involved. On the fourth night, she made her move to give herself to me and I stopped her cold in her tracks. You should have seen the look on her face. I ended up staying with her for a week straight, but there was no sex involved. It blew her mind that I wasn't trying to fuck her, and it had on some little girl antics to see if there was somebody else since it wasn't her. And that started to turn me off. When she showed up to the boarding house I was staying in on some stalker shit, it really turned me off, though it was entertaining. But when I had to stop her from going to jail, though I was riding with a hundred years in the car with me, that was the last straw. We ended up parting ways on good terms, but for some odd reason, she still wanted me. There was something about holding her through the night and not trying anything sexual that fucked her head up. No man had ever treated her in that fashion, and she was willing to do whatever it took to make it right. The only issue with that was that I was not looking for that type of relationship after the last one. But again, we parted ways on good terms, so she stayed shooting her shot. For what, I responded, even though I knew the direction she was finna take the conversation. Because I want you, she shot back. The thought crossed my mind to hang up, but I didn't. The thought also crossed my mind to tell her the complete truth, but that thought passed too. I was in no mood to be dealing with her and her shenanigans. You remember what happened the last time I let you come over my house? I paused to laugh at the thought. You straight tried to take my dick from me. I do not feel like wrestling with your big ass today, so the answer is no. That did not go over well with her, but that wasn't my problem. I wanted no parts of that pussy or the woman that came with it, and I acted like it. We could be the best of friends, but other than that, that's where it stopped. When I got off of the phone with her, I got a couple calls for some birthday shirts that needed to be done as soon as possible. You know them last minute people. I wasn't really in the mood to do any work, but they promised to pay extra for the inconvenience, and that caught my attention. Also, the fact that they only wanted some pictures on the shirts. So I got them in and out before they even made it to my house to pick them up. As soon as I had secured that paper, I was off to the graveyard to pay my respects and run my idea past Eddie Kane. I had been trying to reach out to every woman that I had sex with on my bed to see if they would be interested in attending the burning ceremony, but I had been getting turned down left and right. In my mind, it was the greatest act of transparency ever, but nobody seen it that way. 
I can't tell you the names of every woman that got that action on that mattress. Just know that there were a plethora and I stopped keeping count after I cracked 50. And that was before I moved into the apartment that I had been living in for the last 18 months. Eddie Kane didn't have nothing to say as usual, but I finished running it down to him. Forgive me, but he didn't talk much in life, so talking to the dirt kind of got me the same response in his death. I wasn't sure if I would be able to pull it off, but I promised him that I would put my best foot forward to try to make it happen either way. I even called a few more possible guests to see what they had to say on the subject, and I'm not going to repeat their answers. Just know I got cussed out all three times. When I got back in traffic, I didn't have anywhere to go or anybody that I really wanted to see, so I stopped to roll a blunt then took a tour of the city. Every time I found myself in Jenny's, I couldn't help but stop by the old house. The memories, good and bad, always came back to me in a rush, and it was a feeling that I couldn't explain. I had lost so much of my life living and visiting in that house, but for some odd reason, it called out to me. I even considered buying it back from the bank and fixing it back up, but Edna Jean stopped me. She wanted no parts of that house anymore for herself or me, so I respected her mind on the subject. Random. I had a falling out with an old friend behind that house, and he don't even know the real reason behind it. It's an extremely long story, but I'll sum it up like this. He told me that my mother's dog baby girl ran away when he was living her out there got kicked in. But the truth was, when I got out of prison for the second time and went back to the house to shoot the video for my song, Forgive Me, I actually found her body in the basement completely mummified in an old chair. It broke my heart in such a way because I had told my mother the lie that he had told me and that was an unforgivable act. My next stop put me in front of my grandparents' old house and those memories brought a different set of feelings for me. I had promised my cousin Lil D, a.k.a. Donnell Williams, 107-5841, who was serving a double life sentence for killing a pregnant white lady in the stupidest robbery ever that I would send him some pictures of the old neighborhood before I left. So as soon as I got that out of the way, I was back in traffic to my next destination. I have never been one to claim a neighborhood or anything like that. But if I had to, it would be the 1500 block of Ruskin. I jumped off of the porch in the late 80s and never really looked back. When I was growing up, the 50 block, as it was called, was one of the most treacherous places in the city. So much so that most of my friends growing up are either dead in prison doing extremely long sentences, or live out of state. But the majority of them were dead, and most of them were killed by somebody that lived in the neighborhood. Due to the fact I wasn't riding around prepared to go to war, after I got the pictures that I wanted for Smurf, a.k.a. Juwan Connell, 110-8373, and O.E., a.k.a. Ernest Hurst, 22-1852, I was back in traffic trying to get as far away from that place as possible. Satisfied with my walk down memory lane for the day, as I made my way back towards the house, you couldn't imagine who texted me. Where you at, Mr. Smith? Read the text from Taylor and it put a smile on my face. I was halfway to the house when I responded to it, but as soon as I dropped my phone back in my lap, I put my heavy foot down on the gas and sped up. Have you seen me drive? I hadn't enjoyed Taylor's energy since she left me asleep in my bed, as usual, and I couldn't wait to do it again. What would have took me 20 minutes to drive at regular St. Louis speeds only took me seven at the most. Please keep in mind, I used to high speed at any given time when the laws cut the cherry zone. Plus, the car I was in had 160 on the dash, and I made sure that it got driven like that. No need to tell you what kind of car it was because it was a rental, and I don't see no need to brag on the car I didn't own. I made it to the house and was rolling up a couple of blunts when she finally pulled up. I had it on my mind she was finna break up with me again, so I was getting prepared to smoke my pain away. Hello, beautiful, I greeted her after I opened the door. Hello, handsome, she responded as she walked past me and went up the steps. When she turned left at the top going towards the t-shirt shop, my heart dropped. That was always where the we-need-to-talk conversation started. And I knew it because it had happened on more occasions than I could account. The thought crossed my mind to just sit on the steps and not put myself through it but I couldn't resist following her. Damon, we need to talk, she started as soon as I entered the room behind her. Yes, ma'am, I responded. You should have seen the look on her face. The lady was beautiful, and her mocha complexion almost glowed in the dim light of the room. Coconut oil. I already kind of knew in which direction the conversation was about to go, but I couldn't stop staring at her. 
What are we doing, she paused, just long enough to walk to the other side of the room. Ain't you finna leave? Why are you still holding on to me? I'm just trying to love you, I answered while continuing to stir. I really didn't have anything to say, because I had already said it. I had already kind of confessed my love for her and her energy. I had already begged her to be the first thing that I seen when I woke up in the morning. I had already told her that I would leave any other woman that wasn't her alone if I had her all to myself. There was nothing more for me to say in my mind, so I just enjoyed the view while I had it, and she was something to look at. Don't do that, she shot back. The thought crossed my mind to say something, but I kept my comment to myself and continued to admire the view in front of me. So you not gonna say nothing, she cut back in when I didn't respond? What you want me to say, love, I questioned. Say something, Damon. She paused to give me her little look. You know the one where she gives you the once over from head to toe? You have all these women, including me, vying for a position in your life. Kira don't have no problem popping up whenever she feels like it. Destiny is crazy and won't stay out of my inbox. And you wouldn't believe that she even sent my husband a message trying to tell on me and I don't get it. I have never had to compete for a man's attention, and I am not about to start now, no matter how much I love you. Meanwhile, I'm just holding my stern, trying not to lose my thought. I could see that it was making her a little bit uncomfortable, but I paid it no mind. She was well worth looking at on the front end, and on the back end, I didn't want to say anything that might make the situation worse on my end. So you just gonna keep stirring at me, I guess, she huffed, finally showing some of the frustration that I sensed in her. I'm just enjoying the view, I responded in all honesty. What are you enjoying, Damon? Please tell me, she shot back. The thought crossed my mind to fill her in on the truly appropriate, inappropriate thoughts that I was having as I admired her, but I knew that that wouldn't help the situation. I was in love with a married woman that wasn't exactly proud of our relationship, though she wouldn't leave me alone, and that was a slippery slope. Words were not going to be enough to calm the emotional ride that she was on. So after putting a few seconds of thought into it, I went with what I felt, opposed to what I was thinking. What are you doing, she questioned, as I quickly closed the distance between us to pull her into my warm embrace. There was no need for words. The connection that I had built with her was based more on the energy between us than it was the words that we exchanged. I had figured that out the third time that she tried to break up with me, and the information was always in the forefront of my mind when dealing with her. She resisted for a split second. Don't get me wrong. Then her body just relaxed, and I could feel all the tension leaving from her as she practically melted in my arms. It was one of those feelings that words can't explain, I swear for the Lord. It was also the very reason that we were standing there in the first place. I still didn't have anything that I really wanted to say, so I just enjoyed holding her close to me. There was something about the way that it made me feel that made me want to do it. I couldn't explain it. I couldn't rationalize it either. I didn't even know why I wanted to do it. There was just something about holding her in my arms that just felt right, and that feeling meant everything in the world to me. I can't tell you how long we stood in the middle of the floor hugging, but what I can say is when we finally did separate, the three kisses got exchanged. I don't know where I got the idea from to start doing that with the women that I dealt with. But once I got it started, it became my thing, and I used it with any and every one of them to fit into the status quo. Don't get me wrong, though. There were a lot of women that I gave the business to that have never received that term of endearment from me. They were either not that special or not someone that I wanted to be a part of my life forever, and those were the terms and conditions that were with that. But for those that did exchange them with me, it meant the world to me, and they knew it. I had been doing everything in my power to show Taylor how much she meant to me, but it was never enough. She had already pledged her allegiance to another man long before we met, and our time together, no matter how beautiful or extraordinary it was, was not enough to break that bond. I couldn't blame her for it, nor did I judge her on the situation because there were so many intangibles that had to be taken into consideration. Children, lifestyle, outside influences. And most importantly, the fact that I was planning on leaving the city as soon as my lease was up. The thought crossed my mind to once again confess my love for her, but I kept it to myself. There was no need in opening that side of my emotions to her, knowing that she would be leaving me at any moment. And you wouldn't believe as soon as it ran across my mind, that is exactly what she did. As soon as she exited the room headed towards the steps, 
I really didn't know what to do. Several things crossed my mind, but I didn't feed into any of the thoughts. The only thing that mattered to me in that moment was that I had had her for whatever amount of time had passed since she came into my life, and that was the most important thing to me. Yesterday is gone and tomorrow will never come, my uncle used to say. I had made a habit of being honest about how I felt and what I wanted where she was concerned, and I continued with that pattern as she disappeared out of my sight. Please don't leave me. I begged as I heard her feet shuffling down the steps to leave my residence. I can't tell you how I felt when I heard the door close. It was one of those feelings of defeat that you never really want to talk about. The only bright side to the situation was that I had already rolled up something to smoke the pain away. And that's exactly what I did. That good gas always makes the hurt go away, especially when it's that pressure. When I got the text that she made it home safely, I felt a different type of pain. You can only imagine how it felt to know the woman that you wanted to be sleeping with was at home finna get in the bed with another man and there was nothing that you could do about it. That was my reality. And it was more real than I wanted it to be. Thank Edna Jean for this pressure I said to myself as I fired up another blunt to smoke the rest of my pain away. Chapter 6 I woke up Friday morning and didn't even want to get out the bed. My morning lie was the furthest thing from my mind but I couldn't help myself. I had so many personal shirts that I knew that that would be the perfect place to get rid of them without having to do too much work. Social media blew my mind when it came to that type of stuff because no matter what it was, if it was free, somebody wanted it. I never understood that. As soon as the live ended, my phone started ringing with people begging. I wasn't really in the mood, but I kind of set myself up for it so I entertained the nonsense. It was always crazy how I could be offering to give away one thing for free, but people would call me asking for things that I had never mentioned to them. I'm so glad Energy taught me how to say no in a few different languages. After I got myself together and dropped off the packages that I had going out, I stopped by the St. Louis Community Credit Union to check in. I hadn't made a deposit in a couple of days and I truly missed the ambiance. There was something about putting up the money that I didn't need that made me want to put up the money that I didn't need if you get what I'm saying. Also, I wanted to make sure that my sister and best friend's names were still attached to my worst case scenario account. I had been playing in the streets my whole life, and the main thing that my mother always preached to me was to have lawyer and funeral money put up. Death in jail was the only thing that came with hustling in St. Louis, and she always wanted me to be fully prepared. I had seen so many people get to a bag in the streets, but couldn't afford a lawyer when they got caught or had to have somebody sell plates or wash cars to put them in the ground after they got killed. I never wanted that for myself, nor did I ever want to see my face on a GoFundMe account for my services. Forgive me. When I found out how much it cost to be cremated, I hid the money in an account that didn't have a card attached to it and put a couple names on it to handle that for me when the time came. Worst case scenario. It made going through life a little easier because I knew for a fact that I had me covered even in death, and the only thing that I needed to be worrying about was living life while I had it. Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow will never come. When I got back to the car after playing in the bank, my phone waited till as soon as I was ready to pull off the ring. I almost ignored it at first, but due to the fact that I had to reach past my phone to turn up the radio, I hoped for the best and answered the call. Hey, now... I want the shirt with your mama in the $2 bill and the one with the weed leaves and serenity prayer on the back of it or more started before continuing to call off her wish list. I can't explain how I knew it was her, but I knew it was her. The sound of Amora's voice was probably her worst quality. It always sounded like she was nagging for some odd reason. But that wasn't the first thing that caught my attention about her when I met her, so I dealt with what I didn't like about her for what I did. Amora was 4'11". 135 pounds with a lot taking place. She didn't look too bad in the face, and on top of that, her little ass was so loose it moved when she walked, I swear for the Lord. Plus, she kept in touch with me while I was doing my last prison sentence, and that endured her to my heart in such a way. What you gonna do for all of my question once she let me get a word in? What you want me to do, she shot back. So many thoughts crossed my mind, I damn near got excited. Amor had been down for whatever I could come up with before I went back to prison. Stuff to talk about on the yard. And nothing had changed since I came back home. What time your dude get off, I finally responded after I got my thoughts together. I just dropped him off, she answered. 
Where you at? She shot back with a question of her own. I'm around the corner from the crib, finna grab some blunts and take it back in. I explained as I pulled into the gas station lot and hopped out of the car. I'm on my way then. See you in a few minutes, she paused. If I don't beat you, though, she finished before ending the call. Randall, you couldn't imagine that the thought of why I stopped hustling crossed my mind right at the register. But it did. I used to sell ecstasy pills in the morgue and had no problem testing them out for me. I could write a whole book about what she did one night after I crushed one down and blew it in her ass, but that's another story. Let me get back to telling this one. When I pulled up, it didn't surprise me that she was already there waiting on me. Amor was kind of good about keeping her word on whatever it was that she said, and that was another quality that I held her in high regard for. We had that conversation one time after I got into a high-speed chase waiting on her, and we never had to have it again. The shit that come with drug dealing. Come her love, I greeted her as she jumped into my arms and wrapped her legs around me. It was something like our unofficial official greeting, and I always made sure that I massaged them cheeks before I put her down. Hi, Daddy, she responded as she bounced in my arms. The thought crossed my mind to carry her up the steps so I could have that to talk about, but I didn't. I opened the door and waited at the bottom so I could watch each cheek move independently as she walked up the steps in the royal blue leggings. I could give you the long and drawed out version of how we took a shower before I played in her ass and beat that pussy up for a couple of hours. But I'm not. What I will tell you is why I did it. Because that's more important and more interesting. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I happen to be in something like a relationship with an ex whose name I shall not mention, though it's tattooed on my body, when I met him more. I didn't know that they knew each other at first. And by the time I found out, I had already knocked her down. It did not go over well with my ex. But it also didn't stop me from continuing to do it either. Her ass was so loose. Plus, I was on the run. It bothered my ex so much that even after our breakup, every time we ran into each other, she always brought Amor's name up. I always wanted to talk about the other important things that ruined our relationship, like how she fucked my credit up or why she attached her bills to my bank account on auto pay, or how she destroyed three cars in a year, or how she let somebody in her family steal one of my guns. But she never wanted to talk about that stuff. All our conversations went left at who I was fucking, and was I still fucking with more. And to be completely honest with you, that was the only reason why I continued to indulge in more sexuality. As bad as it sounds, I just wanted to truthfully be able to answer yes when questioned about the subject and have all the nasty details to bag it up. I hold a grudge different. It's not the first time that I use my sex as a weapon, but that's another story for another time. The craziest part about that is, a more played a part in that one too. But let me get back to telling you this one before I get distracted. The thought crossed my mind I had that conversation with her about burning my bed while I was giving her the business but I kept it to myself. I figured that it could wait until her eyes were not rolled in the back of her head and I had her complete attention. When I finally decided that I had enough of her to compensate me for the bag full of shirts that she took and a great rundown of how she took it in case I ran into the ex, we smoked a blunt and talked about what I had up my sleeve. Day, I don't have no problem with you jumping up and down in this pussy, especially knowing that it rubs your ex the wrong way, she laughed. Is she still asking about me every time you run into her? Every time I shot back and we both laughed about it. But I am under no circumstances, she cut back in mid-giggle. And I mean no circumstances showing my face at something like that. Knowing you, you never know who I might run into. What you mean you never know who you might run into, I question, though I already knew what she was talking about. Her explanation covered several women who I shall not mention by name, that she knew for a fact that I had enjoyed sexual relations with, how they were connected to her boyfriend or one of his friends, and why that was an issue that she refused to deal with. Our relationship had been based on a twisted secret that evolved into a grudge against the ex, and that was as far as she wanted it to go. Nothing that I said moved her in any direction towards participating, and I finally conceded defeat on the subject as I settled for some parting ways for Lacio before she left my residence. I wonder what I'm doing wrong, I thought to myself as I fired up the third blunt of the day. No matter how I tried to sell my idea to any woman that happened to be eligible to participate, 
I got turned down, and I didn't get it. Hung up on, cussed out, called dirty names, and my personal favorite blocked and deleted on social media. I couldn't understand how none of them wanted to be a part of the greatest act of transparency ever thought of, but it was slowly sinking in that that might be the case. Don't get me wrong, though. I was steady pressing the issue. I refused to believe that I couldn't get nobody's daughter to show up to my soul tie breaking experience. And I had a black book full of names, dates, and phone numbers to choose from. So when I finished getting myself together, I started sending out texts. I have never been moved by failure because I know for a fact that success sits on the other end of that spectrum. I'm not going to bore you with any of the responses that I received because not one of them was out of the norm of what I had been receiving. When I finished with all of the A's, I got in traffic. I didn't have a specific destination other than pulling up on Eddie Kane, so when I got there, I let my street music No Vulgarity project play through a couple of times while I worked on the B's and C's. The F's and G's played out just like the D's and E's, and I was just about ready to throw my phone, but it rung first. Fresh out ENT, I answered as I regularly did my business phone. I would play out for you the conversation that I had with the person on the other end, but it would be irrelevant. I stopped indulging in anything that came with a prison chance, and that was all my caller wanted to discuss. I was not about to make a few moves with him to pick up some paper, no matter how much it interested me, because that was no longer my path. Nothing could be said to change my mind on the subject, and the call got ended before the level of temptation got out of control. I should have just tossed this motherfucker, I thought to myself as I looked at the dirt and rubbed my head in frustration. Confession time. Though I walked away from the street life and stopped indulging in the nonsense that came with him, that was not my plan. I can honestly say that I planned on dying in the streets for some odd reason or another, and I was fine with it. I was also fine with going to prison for the rest of my life or any other consequence or repercussion that came with the lifestyle that I was living. I always tell people that I stopped hustling because that was my mother's dying wish for me. I stopped hustling because that was my mother's dying wish. I stopped hustling because of my mother. I don't know how I can say it where it made sense to the outside world looking in or even those on the inside with me looking out. But however it gets said, I stopped hustling because that was my mother's dying wish for me. I can't say where I would be in life right now if it wasn't, but I can say that I would have been fine with whatever the circumstances were. Jail, prison, death, or balling out of control. It wouldn't have mattered to me at all. I came to grips with the consequences of my actions sitting in 5C at MSP under investigation for number 11, introducing drugs into the institution. And I've been rocking out ever since. And as sad as this gonna sound, not a day goes by that the thought doesn't cross my mind to pick that bag back up and get right back to it like I never left. The only reason I don't, and I mean the only reason, is that I gave energy in my word, and that means more to me than anything else. It means more to me than the money, fame, experiences, or whatever else comes with it, because she meant more to me than those things. My Uncle Percy used to tell me that if I visited the barbershop enough times, that I would eventually get a haircut. And as a child, it made no sense to me. As an adult, I completely comprehended what he meant. So much so that when I finally decided to leave the street life alone, I walked away from every noun that connected me to them. Any person, place, or thing that came with a penitentiary chance got left behind. I can't tell you how many people that I love with my whole heart that I no longer talk to. Or how many places that I enjoy going that I no longer visit. And even though that is not the way that I wanted it, that is the way that it has to be. When you understand the consequences of your actions, you understand the consequences of the actions of the people that you be around also. And I had no intention of being a part of somebody's indictment just because I love them. Damn, I'm going to miss you dirty, I thought to myself before blocking the number and putting my phone in my pocket. Just the thought of passing up that easy money touched me somewhere that I don't care to discuss. I struggle daily with figuring out how to support myself without the help of the drug trade, finessing, hitting licks, credit card schemes, insurance fraud, or intercepting the bank drop from any business that I might happen to catch leaning because I no longer played in the streets. When I made it back to the car, the only thing on my mind was comfort food. A half order of deluxe fried rice, chicken, beef, shrimp, and crab, no onions, in a big box, and that was my next destination. 
I had a few choices of places to get it from, but due to the fact that I didn't have at least one gun on me, I settled for the safest of the three and pulled up to Lisa's. Still lost in thought about that little piece of change that I had let get past me, after I placed my order, I started questioning myself about what I was doing. Why was I doing it? And would it really work out if I kept to the straight and narrow? I had so many questions for myself that I already asked myself on I don't know how many different occasions that it caught me off guard when the lady sitting next to me called my name, breaking me from my conversation with myself. Excuse me, I responded. Your name Damon Smith, right? They call you Mr. Hey now, she paused. My friends share all your stuff on Facebook. I love what you did for your mother. I can't tell you how many times that has happened to me, but every time is always like the first. I never really know what to say, so I just shake my head and respond with yes ma'am or yes sir, depending on who I'm talking to. I caught your live about this new book that you have out with your mother's picture in it. She hesitated trying to recall the title. Solitary confinement, my walls are talking, I cut in to help the conversation along. Yes, that one. She paused and gave me the weirdest look. I want it. Do you have any or do I have to order it online, she questioned. I wasn't completely sure if I did or she did. So I walked back to the court to check and see. My mother taught me the value of tangible things and you wouldn't believe that it was only one copy left of the 50 that I ordered to sell myself. It left me stuck for a split second. And though it wasn't the first book I sold, or the first time that I got asked for my autograph in the process, the whole time I could actually hear my mother's voice answering the questions I had just asked myself. Don't worry about where the money gonna come from. Just keep your word and everything else gonna take care of itself. Chapter 7 I wonder what this nigga want, I thought to myself as I looked at the Instagram DM from MBZ Live. Several things crossed my mind. But knowing him, it was always the last possible thing that I could come up with, and that made dealing with him a pleasure. His life revolved around music and money, and those were two things that we never disagreed on. I usually didn't go live on the weekends, so after I got myself together, I returned his message, then my phone rang. Day, I need you, gang, and BZ started as soon as his face popped up on the screen of my iPhone. FaceTime. What's the word, gang? How can I be of service to you, I responded. They tell me you got a truck, he shot back. Nope, but you know me. I paused to fire up the half a blunt that I left in the ashtray. I can make it make sense, though. Where you at? I'm at the house, he answered. Say less, I shot back before ending the call and taking my time to finish smoking. I know I mentioned at some point that I was riding in a rental car that I didn't feel the need to stress to make a model. That had been the case for the last few years of my life, and it helped me in more ways than it hurt. National Rental Corps had been a blessing for me when I played in the streets, and it continued to be one after I made the transition out of them. I swapped cars so many times when I was running through the bag that I got to know most of the people that worked there. I swear for Lord. It made it a breeze to get in and out no matter what time I pulled up. Social media made it easier to know who was at work at what time, and even easier to contact them by DM or inbox to get the business handled before I ever actually got there. I can't say how many times I had to buy somebody lunch to get what I wanted done when I wanted it done, but that was a small price to pay for the convenience. It was also better than having to talk to customer service to make up something that I knew wasn't true just to bring the car back and get another one. It had happened one time after I had to take off on them people, high speed chase, and that was the best few dollars I ever spent to get me out of a jam. And all they wanted was Subway. It only took 15 minutes to get out of the car I was in and into a truck. I wasn't sure of how big of a truck I would need dealing with MBZ, so I settled for the biggest thing on the lot and got back in traffic. The thought crossed my mind to call MBZ to find out if there was going to be any heavy lifting involved, but I kept it to myself and prayed for the best. Right on, gang, MBZ started as soon as he hopped in. I need to go grab a few bikes right quick. Huh? I shot back. The Jazz Granderson Foundation is holding their third annual holiday toy drive today. I rock with Coach Gerard and I gotta make my donation, he paused. I gave him my word I was coming through and I can't disappoint. Where they having it at, I questioned. Vashon High School, big bro, he started, before giving me the rundown of everything that they were giving away, like haircuts, food, toys, artist performances, and whatever else special they could come up with. 
I kind of heard about the event from one of the Grand Camp football coaches that came and got some sweatshirts made. And I forgot all about it. Blame the weed. Listening to MBZ run down the rundown brought it back to the front of my mind. And I was glad that I had a few boxes of fresh out ENT shirts with me. So what you thinking? Wally World of Target, I questioned giving them options. Don't matter, gang, he paused to grab my fire with the blunt that was tucked perfectly behind his right ear. I got gas, money, and weed. I'll leave the rest up to you. Taking a few seconds to get my burns together, the closest store to my current location was Wally World. Taking another few seconds to Google kids' bikes, I found out that they were cheaper at Target and that made more sense. And BZ was all for saving a couple of dollars and that was our next destination. I wasn't in the store a good three minutes before I had my shoes off and was sliding down one of the aisles for my Facebook story. I can't remember why I started going for distance on any floor that had a good shine on it, but it had got me put out of more places than I care to think about. It almost got me put out of Target, but MBZ said something to the lady, and she directed us to the other side of the store where the bikes he was looking for were located. Random. I have never went into a store and bought a bike before, and still haven't. So when MBZ started asking me for my opinion, I honestly didn't have one. I learned how to drive a car before I learned how to ride a bike, and that didn't help the situation at all. Plus, every bike I did ever own was gotten by some illegal means anyway, and that didn't help either. How many bikes are you buying, gang? I questioned unsure about how many a few actually was. Four, he shot back. Well, get two for boys and two for girls, I suggested. That was all he needed to hear, and he passed the information along to the super helpful white man that came to offer us his assistance. The thought crossed my mind to question what took him so long, but I kept it to myself. It was always like that when you weren't in the store trying to steal something. It was also the main reason why I left and let that same super helpful white man earn his check by assisting MBZ in getting all four of those bikes in the truck. When we finally pulled up to Vashon High School, the parking lot was packed. It was even cars parked in places that wasn't parking spaces. You know black people. The thought crossed my mind to say something, but MBZ made a quick call and the red carpet got rolled out. I don't never speak on this because nobody never asked me. But if I had to pick one person that helped me the most on the music end, MBZ Live is that person. He also the main reason why I know the majority of the rappers, artists, producers, videographers, and whatnot throughout the city. He didn't judge me for being an old head trying to do music, and that was a blessing, I swear for Lord. As a matter of fact, he gave me so many pointers on how to keep up with the younger generation that I don't know what I would have done without him. What may have sounded great on a prison yard did not transfer over well to the new age of auto-tunes and plug-ins. Times had changed while I was incarcerated, both times, and he never let me forget it. I could give you a long and draw it out account of where he came into play in my life, but I'm not. It basically boils down to my music career started with him, and we have continued to make it make sense ever since. It's that simple. Shameless plug. In real life, though, he engineered my first project, Say No More, 2016. Also in real life, fast forward, he engineered my single, Grain of Salt, 2019. I ain't gonna say he talked me into it, but I can say that he didn't try to talk me out of it. Not to mention all the unreleased music we had together. Videos, guest appearances, events, shows, charities, or whatever else he got himself invited to, I was subject to be in the building. It was always about connections and interacting with people with MBZ, and this event was no different. I watched him work the room for friends, fans, and followers all while constantly asking myself what I was doing there. No matter how many times I tried to make myself feel like I belonged in that type of environment, dealing with them type of people, it was still a little bit foreign to me. Making donations and all of that was simple, but standing around trying to make conversation with the people that you were donating to was the hardest thing ever for me, and still is. And Beezy handled it like a pro, and I called me a cut to stay out of the way. I can't say how long it took for them to start passing out the food, but the cake was a true highlight, I swear for Lord. It also signaled the beginning of the giveaways, and that was the only reason we were there. MBZ was supposed to perform, but he only brought out the custom version of his latest project, 1111, 
and that was not happening with all the old ladies and children in attendance. You should have seen the DJ face when I caught it. Priceless. The thought crossed my mind to not even say anything because the DJ, whatever his name was, didn't even want to give me the follow back on Instagram. For some odd reason, it's always like that, and people wonder why I don't fuck with DJs. But I couldn't let MBZ turn up to the wrong show mix in good conscience, no matter how I felt about the DJ, because that's what friends are for. I did have something slick to say about it, though. But before I could get it all the way out of my mouth, a familiar voice cut in. Teddy Bird, what you doing here? It put a pause in me for a split second, but you would have to actually know that side of me to understand. The old me was the main reason the new me felt uncomfortable in public places because old street habits are hard to break. I hadn't seen Uncle Rick since I bumped into him and his son at Big Dub 314 Studio a few months prior, and I had the strangest feeling that he was finna bring that day back up. Teddy Burr, tell me that ain't the first person you ever did that to, he started, after we got the introductions to small talk out of the way. That hurt my son in a way I have never seen him hurt before. Uncle Rick, I do not shake hands with niggas I don't fuck with. I laughed at the thought of the look on his son's face when I told him to put his hand down. Nah, he ain't the first person I did that to, nor will he be the last. You know me, I responded. Well, what happened to get it to that point, he questioned. You want me to give you the long or the short version, I shot back. Let's catch a cut, he paused to say a few words to his daughters about winning bikes and how they would get them home, when and if it happened, before sending them off to play. You can give me the long version, he finished. I had so many reasons on why I no longer dealt with his son that I started at the top of the list and worked my way down. When I made it to the ladder, he told me about Edna Jean Dog when he was living in her house and how I passed the lie along to my mother, he stopped me. I hadn't even got to the point about where he left me for dead when I went to prison. The fact that he signed a record deal and never shouted me out not once, or more importantly, that we recorded several songs that I paid for, that he never pushed when I got locked back up the second time, though he gave me his word he would. But I made it a point to slide those in, too. And you wouldn't believe by the time I finished running down where I was coming from, both of his daughters had won bikes in the giveaway, and he completely understood why I treated his son like he didn't exist to me. The thought crossed my mind to tell him that my mother had made me promise that I wouldn't kill him when I found out that he hadn't been visiting her in the nursing home when I was locked up. To me, it was breaking one of those prison rules that deserves some form of a life or death consequence. But to her... His life situation was his karma for how he played it with me, and she did not under any circumstance want me to interfere with it. But I kept that to myself. You couldn't imagine how it felt to be behind the camera taking a picture of MBZ, Coach Gerard, and Uncle Rick's daughters after they both won one of the bikes that he donated. And I ain't even gonna try to explain it to you. Just know that it was truly surreal standing next to my past taking a picture of my present and I was the only connection between them. Ain't nobody gonna believe you, Day. I thought to myself as my other phone vibrated in my pocket. The thought crossed my mind to ignore it, but I didn't. What I did was silently pray that it was some money on the other end before I unlocked the screen and checked the notification. Where you at? I need two shirts made, read the text from Keisha. The same few thoughts as always crossed my mind before I responded. So when I finally did, I told her exactly what I was doing and she didn't believe me. The nerve. The thought crossed my mind to argue with her about my truth, but common sense stepped in. The thought also crossed my mind to miss out on her money for that same reason, but common sense prevailed again. We agreed on the time to meet at the shop and it didn't surprise me at all that her last text came attached with the same emojis as usual. The thought crossed my mind after I dropped MBZ off to find something else to do with my time, but I didn't follow it. I made a quick stop in traffic to bump into my weed man and made it back to the house a few minutes before she was supposed to pull up. I started to get out of the car and go in the house, but I changed my mind and decided to roll up a blunt while I waited so I wouldn't have to run up and down the steps. Day, she is not finna give you that pussy again, I told myself as I fired up. 
It was never my intention to knock down my dude wife in the first place. But once she kicked it off, I promised myself that she would get the business business every time she put herself in that position. By the time she finally pulled up, I was halfway through my blunt and my conscience had stopped talking to me. Good weed made it easy to rationalize what might or might not happen when we got alone. And that was all that I was looking for. I had been arguing with myself feeling like I was betraying a friend by what I was doing to her. But that wasn't the case. The rule was to never initiate sexual contact with her. And as long as I followed that, whatever happened, happened. I wasn't sure what was about to happen being that this meeting was set up as a business call. But I found out halfway through getting her two unicorn shirts together as her hand slid up my leg to massage the package. If she pulls the dick out, she gets no mercy. I told myself as I allowed her to pull and tug on the man meat through my sweatpants. The thought crossed my mind to tell her to stop until I was finished doing what I was doing. But before I could get the words to come out of my mouth, she had already pulled it out and was gently sucking on the head. I don't know if I'm the only person that completely stops everything they're doing during fellatio, but I do. Leaning back in the chair I was sitting in, I let her oily have at it while I enjoyed the view of watching her work. It was something about getting head from a woman that you know is going to tell her significant other that they love them with that same mouth that makes it a little better for some odd reason. Don't judge me. Don't get me wrong, though. As usual, it didn't last long anyway, and I got back to work on our order as soon as her jaws got tired. It must have been meant to be, though. Because as soon as she pulled the dick out of her mouth, her phone run. And you should already know who was on the other end. I'm finna go to the car and take this call, she explained before grabbing her phone and heading towards the door. Tell my dude I said, what's up? I shot back as I listened to her feet shuffling down the steps. She ain't shit for that, I thought to myself as I finished her order and bagged up the shirts before she came back. In my mind, him calling was a sign that she shouldn't be in my house doing what she was doing. But as soon as she came back, she dropped her knees and got right back to letting her mouth work. I started to question it at first, but as soon as she started putting the sound effects on me, I pushed the thought from my mind to let her handle her business. It caught me by surprise that the second time around lasted longer than the first, but I kept it to myself. I hadn't planned on ever enjoying her pleasures again after the last time I did that to her. But since I found myself in the situation again, I plan to take full advantage of it. When she finally decided to come up for some air, I watched her slowly strip out of her clothes while I enjoyed the view and rolled another blunt. I had already made up my mind that she would get no mercy from me this time around, and I planned to be extra groovy when I gave it to her. You know I'm finna beat that pussy up, I explained after passing the weed. Good, she paused and inhaled. Don't threaten me with a good time, I want all that. And you finna get it, I shot back as I grabbed her hand and escorted her to my bedroom. I would give you the play-by-play -play with the most intimate details about how I gave her the dick in any and every way that I could think of, but I'm not. I'm not gonna tell you that I awed her down and slid the dick in and out of her pussy until she was damn near running from it, or that every time she hopped off of it, I put it in her mouth because I wanted to watch her suck her juices off me. I'm not gonna tell you that either. I'm not going to tell you that I made her ride me so I could choke her and talk dirty to her about how wrong she was for giving me a pussy knowing that I knew her husband or that I literally smacked her up with the dick on some super porn star shit. I'm not going to tell you that either. I'm not even going to tell you that she was still begging for it after I thought she had had more than enough a good hour into it. I'm going to leave all that information out because it's not all that important to me. But what I will tell you is that when I was certain that her mouth and pussy had perceived a proper workout, I took advantage of how slippery that coconut oil made her ass as I slid the head in. It wasn't the first time I fucked my dude wife in her ass, but this time around I made sure it was one to remember. I don't know if you know what gaping is, but if you don't, when you find out she got that action too. I ran her through most of the positions I enjoyed her vaginally and anally, and she damn near went crazy. By the time I got on her side with the whole dick stuffed in her ass, I could tell that she was in a different place mentally. 
I had been trying my best to take it easy on her, though I wasn't taking it easy on her, if you get what I'm saying. But as soon as I got a leg up where I could watch the dick sliding in and out of her backside, she gave me the strangest look before grabbing my free hand, putting it around her neck and telling me to come in her ass in a tone that I had never heard her use. It put a pause in me for a split second because that was something new for her, but I didn't let it show. To be completely honest, it actually turned me on a little bit more for some odd reason. And after we switched positions so she could ride the dick with her ass, I went against my rule about kissing her and gave her one of the most intimate tongue kisses as I followed her instructions and made my deposit in her rear end. The thought crossed my mind to later and cuddle with her afterwards, but it didn't last long. The reality of the situation came back to me as soon as the tingling sensation passed, and I acted accordingly. I didn't even know how to respond when she brought up the fact that that was the first time I had ever kissed her like that, so I kept it to myself. I wanted to break it down for her and tell her the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but I didn't. I seen no reason in tipping my hand that I had completely lost control of myself in the moment of lust because I knew for a fact that she would figure out a way to use it against me. Truth be told, I damn near told her I loved her and some more shit in the moment, but it passed just as fast. I don't know if it was the look on her face, the intensity of the energy between us, the feeling of losing myself somewhere I knew I had no place being, or the fact that I knew what I was doing could possibly turn into a life or death situation. But whatever it was, it was a moment, and I enjoyed that moment for everything that it was actually worth. I could hear my Uncle Percy saying, Yesterday is gone and tomorrow will never come, as I watched her get in her car. You better make the most of today, young nigga, because it might be your last. Chapter 8 I woke up Sunday morning with Edna Jean fresh on my mind, and I can't even tell you why. Well, yes, I can. The truth is I have nightmares regularly about the day I watched my God die. To be even more transparent on the subject, I don't even want him to stop I know that sounds strange, but in my mind, they put me back in the room with her again for our last conversation, and I can't turn that down. I wish I would have said more. I wish I would have asked more questions. I wish I could have came to an understanding with her other son. I wish the rest of her family would have shown up. And more importantly, I wish I wouldn't have had Rose standing right next to me while I was doing it. I've had a lot of women in my life, but Rose took the cake. If you let her tell it, we are supposed to be together and live happily ever after. And she could be right. But to me, it plays out a whole lot differently. In my mind, I wish I wouldn't have crossed the sexual line with her in the first place. So much so that my morning started off with several Facebook posts about wishing I could take my sex back from somebody. Social media nonsense. The strangest part about it was that it covered a plethora of my past relationships. So it kind of killed two birds with one stone. On the front end, it entertained my friends and followers with the twisted sense of humor that I'm known for. And on the back end, on a much more serious note, it will forever be a social media reminder that that thought crossed my mind. I could go into detail about the relationship that I had with her before we became best friends, but that's neither her nor there. What is important is why, though. Confession. I've never told anybody this, and I don't really want to speak on it now. But I have to clear the earth for not only myself, but for anybody that wonders what's going on with me and her. When our sexual relationship evolved into a friendship without the benefits, it was because of Edna Jean. It was actually the second time in my life that my mother let me know that she did not approve of how I dealt with the woman. Don't get me wrong, I didn't do anything sideways or underhanded where Rose was concerned. But I was always myself in every situation that concerned my dealings with her. Meaning that I never lied to her, but being forthcoming with the whole truth never happened either. And the Jean called it lying by omission and wanted me to know that she had had a dream that Rose would be the woman that killed me if she ever found out about the life that I lived when I wasn't in her presence. At first I took it as a joke because I had already come to grips that I would die in the streets for some odd reason or another. But she was persistent in her explanation. It threw me off for a second as she continued to explain it to me because she never lied to me about anything. Not nothing small, not nothing medium, and not nothing large my whole life. 
So after I finally got the giggles out of my system that I couldn't control, I began to take her words more seriously. Random. Rose took time out of her day to visit my mother when I wasn't around. I can't tell you what they talked about or in which direction those conversations went because they both agreed that I should mind my business. In my mind, my mother was my business. But as Edna Jean explained it, she was my mother, I wasn't her father, and that kind of settled it. It was her go-to line every time she didn't want to deal with a situation that came with me questioning her, and it worked every time. It was a point I couldn't argue. When it was all said and done, the only thing that I took from the conversation was that at some point, Rose made it crystal clear that she would do something to me about my promiscuous ways if the whole truth was ever presented to her. And to be completely honest, I didn't doubt it for one second. For some odd reason, I have always been attracted to crazy women, and Rose was no different in that aspect. And though I can't say I have ever seen her act crazy or even lose her temper at any point in our relationship, and the gene let me know that that was the tail sign that I needed to be paying very close attention to because if I didn't, it would eventually be the death of me. Completely random. I have dealt with some certifiable young ladies throughout my lifetime that unfortunately came with getting stabbed, shot at, almost ran over, police called, brothers, uncles, cousins, and fathers involved, and the list goes on and on. I can't say how I made it out of some of those situations in one piece, but I did. Needless to say, that breakup was one of the hardest things that I have ever had to do. I wanted to keep her as a part of my relationship rotation for as long as I had one. But sadly, that was not to be the case. I had ignored my mother's advice more times than I could account, and for good reason, because I also have a story for each one of those instances where the situations that I got myself into could have been avoided by simply following instructions. The response that I received back from my breakup text was exactly what Ed and Jane said it would be. I was so glad that I took her advice on not doing it in person that I don't know what to do. She also told me that in time, being friends with Rose without all of the nasty antics that come with having sex with me will work out better in the long run. And she was right. The only thing that she hadn't prepared me for was the fact that I couldn't take it back no matter what I did. And the weirdest part about that was that Rose always brought it up when it was the furthest thing from my mind. Due to the fact that there was nothing that I could do about that either, I always rolled with the punches in my normal nonchalant manner. So it didn't surprise me at all when she sent me a Facebook message concerning who and what I was talking about with my stats. I wanted to tell her the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but that didn't happen. As usual, I let her stay comfortable in the thought that she had, and I kept it moving. But like I said, those same stats covered a plethora of my past relationships. So it also didn't surprise me either that until Taylor finally graced me with her presence, I was dealing with the nonsense that came with social media. Inboxes, DMs, texts, phone calls, FaceTime, and my personal favorite, I even got a few emails about it. And it would have continued until she turned on the shower and started taking off her clothes. The world stopped. Phones went on the charges, music got turned on, and I was peeling out of my clothes right behind her. As I slid in the shower with her, everything stopped but the moment. Water the right temperature. The coconut oil on the nape of her neck tasted amazing. And that was all the motivation that I needed as I took my time to wash her off from that spot to the bottom of her feet, toe sucking included. I can't tell you how many showers we had taken since the first one, but this one was special, and for more reasons than you might think. The first one being that man's wife was not supposed to be there with me, and most importantly, all breakups aside, I almost ended up stuck in the window. I know on the outside looking in, the window line doesn't make sense to you, but I know for a fact that it hit home for her. But let me make it make sense. I don't know who built the building that I happen to live in, but the shower came with a window. And this window was not only big enough for somebody to sit in, but it was also right in the front. And if that wasn't good enough, to add the cherry on top of it, the shower window also came attached with a tub that held your feet perfectly when you sat in it. Even more random. I don't know how many mornings I went outside to notice that the front of my building was wet from one of my late night episodes only because I stopped keeping count. But back to what I was saying before I get off of the subject. I'm doing everything in my power to dance around the subject of what happened next without flat out saying it. And I don't even know why. 
Well, yes, I do. I know that I previously mentioned that having length and girth has its disadvantages, especially when it comes to receiving fellatio, and that that misfortune has been the story of my life. I can't say that Taylor didn't put her best foot forward in returning her fellatio to my cunnilingus, but I am saying that her staying power didn't go any further than any other woman that I was dealing with at the time. So forgive me if I don't know how to word when the role got reversed and I was the one in the window getting some of the best head that she had to offer. Her pulled into a natural ponytail, water running down her back, unashamed to gag, choke, and everything else that came with trying to have me in the back of her throat head. Both hands working in unison with the occasional eye contact for reassurance. It was beautiful. Add with that, the sound of my music playing in the background, and it combined to make the perfect soundtrack for the moment. I can't give you a timeline on how long that beautiful moment lasted, but I can say that I was starting to water wrinkle before she came up for her. I can also say that it took every fiber in my being not to verbally thank her for going the extra mile, but I kept that to myself. I almost said it a couple more times as I took my time to dry her off before following her into the bedroom for our usual coconut oil rub down, but I kept it to myself again. I had all kind of thoughts running through my head from good to bad, but I kept them all to myself. Not one word got exchanged as I literally touched her from behind her ears to the bottom of her feet, and it wasn't uncomfortable. The silence carried over while she returned the favor with a rub down of her own that was so good, I can't tell you about it. And not because it came with a happy ending or anything so nasty I might want to keep it to myself either. It was nothing like that. I can't tell you about it because I honestly don't remember. When I woke back up, I was home alone as usual, and she was right back to her real life. I kind of felt bad for a minute, but it didn't last long. It only took half a blunt, and I went right back to sleep again. When I woke back up again, I did my best to put the moment behind me and move forward with the day. After sliding into my usual morning Facebook Live video, I enjoyed a cup of coffee as I interacted with my friends and followers until I heard Kira coming up the steps. As she walked into the kitchen with me, the energy in the room changed. I wasn't sure what it was or what it was going to bring, but I could feel it in the earth. Something was different with her, and it didn't take too long to find out. What's wrong, love, I questioned after her three kisses were not as intimate as usual. Do you really love me, she shot back. The thought crossed my mind to let her have her sarcastic retort without responding to it, but I didn't follow it. What that mean? I questioned to keep the conversation going. You know exactly what it mean. She paused to give me that look from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Do you really love me? Here we go with this bullshit, I thought to myself. Don't get me wrong. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've had a woman question my love for her. It happened so much that I stopped really giving it the attention that it really deserved. Part of me wanted to let it go in the hopes that it would go away without me having to explain myself. But strangely, after putting just a little thought into it, I went with the other part of my mind that I figured would come with some form of a confrontation. Taking a quick second to brace myself for whatever her response might be, I repeated my question. What that mean? Damon, stop playing with me. You got all these women in your life and you love all of us. Let you tell it. She paused as her eyes rolled in unison with the air quotation mark she threw up. But I don't be feeling the love. Huh? I shot back completely confused. Don't start playing dumb, Damon. You know exactly what you be doing for some and what you don't be doing for others. She started before taking 10 minutes out of her day to give me a true piece of her mind. I will bore you with all the accusations and pot shots that she took at me for every weird and twisted relationship I was in that she happened to know about, but I'm not. I've been called more dirty names and talked to any type of way by more women than a normal person could possibly imagine. So I actually wasn't listening while doing everything in my power to appear to be listening, if you get what I'm saying. It's honestly the only reason I know for a fact that she went on a 10-minute rant. I spent most of it checking the time and shaking my head like I was fully engaged in the conversation. I wanted to cut in at a few parts to defend my honor, but I waited patiently for my turn. It was the most words I had ever seen her put together at one time, and I was more curious as to how many she would use before she took a deep breath. And then it was my turn. Being that my definition of love was completely different from hers, 
I took a few minutes out of my day to explain it to her in the simplest terms that I could come up with. Love for me is a verb that comes with a physical act. It was explained to me in the best terms ever as that which you go through with somebody. But that always goes over the head of the person that I tell it to. It's so simple, it's complex. Nobody never understands until I break it down into actual examples where it could be processed easier. Like, her issue. I never tell her the whole story. My love. I never told her a lie either. So I cannot be held responsible that I don't volunteer information. Like, her issue. Somebody's daughter is subject to be in my house in the bed when she pops up. It happened on more than one occasion. I'm so glad nobody got hurt. My love, the key that she had to do all her popping up with came directly from me. And besides the one time she got to doing too much, I had never told her she had to leave. Okay, I was listening a little bit. Her idea of love came with what somebody could come back and tell her. Mine's came with all the access in the world to see for herself. But when emotions get involved, rational thinking kind of goes out of the window. You can't ask me about something that I was doing when you could have been doing it with me. It's the purest thing ever. An open invitation into my life. The opportunity to go through whatever I am going through and vice versa. That which you go through with somebody. What more could you ask for? It took me a couple of decades for the definition to register. But when it did... The simplicity of it hit me like a ton of bricks. It was one of those awe moments where the universe lines up and points you in the right direction. Random. You should have seen the look on her face when I told her that I loved her before she went back to work. I promise she looked at the key ring before saying it back. It was the cutest thing ever and the closest that she came to apologizing for questioning my love for her. Even more random. People always wonder where the motivation for my songs come from. Well, let me tell you right fast. Three puffs in the center of myself, the universe lined up again, and I ended up catching an ASAP order that had to be dropped off to the Sound Hustle studio. Where when it was all said and done, I recorded Love Me Back and a few spoken word poems to be used on a later date. Conversations and situations that I happen to be going through at the moment are the motivation. And the universe always puts me in front of a microphone where I can get them off of my chest. It be that easy. Chapter 9 You ever have a bad feeling and then the phone ring and you don't want to answer it? Well, I have. And that is exactly how I found out that I may or may not have contracted the STD trick of Monus. It's all fun until the rabbit got the gun. I thought to myself as Taylor tried her very best to remain calm and she explained it to me. And believe me, she did a very good job at keeping her composure until she got to the point about having to tell her husband what the business was. At that point in the conversation, her voice started to shake, and I could tell she was about to get super emotional. I wanted to say something clever to make her feel better, or something inspirational to make the moment seem more than what it was, but nothing that crossed my mind was on that wavelength. It was at that point that I started to brace myself. In my mind, I knew that after she went through the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, I was about to get cussed out, but it didn't happen. None of the things that came with this type of situation happened either. No breakup, no foul words, no threats, or anything close to it. It actually spooked me for a split second, only because I knew for a fact that Taylor not only had a gun, but that she took it everywhere that she went. You gotta go one day, day, I thought to myself as I called Rose before heading to the clinic. That conversation went just like I thought it would. So much so that before it ended, she not only thanked me for the breakup, but she also had a few jokes about not having to go through that process again. Confession. This is not the first time Trick of Monish came up in my life. And as strange as it may sound, I'm almost convinced that the first time played a very big part in it coming back up. I had done everything in my power to put it behind me and not think about the experience I had while visiting North Carolina and what happened when I came back. But that was not to be the case. It was deja vu all over again. Flashback. Mr. Smith, your results came back. 
The nurse at the North Central Community Health Center started off before a pause that seemed like forever. I had been to the free clinic more times than I could think about in the 41 years that I had been alive because being STD free became first priority since the first time I had to tell my mother that there was something wrong with me down there. I think I was around 13 or 14 at the time, but that was before the streetlight, before two prison sentences, before two books, before three albums, before Edna Jean lost her battle with multiple sclerosis, and long before Fresh Out ENT. Your rapid HIV finger stick came back negative. I down there jumped out of my chair and did my little move, but I played it cool and just shook my head. As far as the sexually transmitted disease, STD trichomonas, she paused to pass me a small cup with four pills in it. Take these and don't drink any alcohol for the next two days. So did I test positive for it? I questioned as I accepted the cup, down the pills, and washed them down with the customary free clinic bottle water. To be completely honest, Mr. Smith, trichomonas is, excuse my language, dirty pussy STD, and most men don't even know they have it. So we don't test men for it. We just treat men that come in and say they have been exposed to it, she answered. Oh, I responded. But before I could ask my next question, she cut right back in. But didn't you tell the doctor that you had 15 girlfriends and one of them called you and told you that she talked to another one of your girlfriends that isn't speaking to you at the moment? And she told her that she tested positive for trichomonas? She questioned with the weirdest smirk on her face. The first thing that crossed my mind was something along the lines of patient-doctor privilege and how I could get some money out of the little Chinese lady for slander. But I let it go just as fast for two reasons. The first being that it explained why all the nurses were looking at me and giggling. And the second was because every time she said the word trichomonas, she followed it with the words dirty pussy, and that tickled the fuck out of me. Yeah, something like that, I admitted with a laugh before licking my lips. Please tell me that you not have an unprotected sex with all of them, she continued. And most importantly, do all of them know about this situation, she questioned. No to your first question. I paused to get my thought together. And in one way or another to the second. The thought crossed my mind to tell her my truth with an explanation. But that thought passed just as fast as it popped in my head. It was none of her business how many of my girlfriends I used a condom with. Just the ones that I didn't. And I did pass along the message I received to all parties involved that may have come in contact with me or been at risk of contracting it. In one way or another, she responded in more of a statement than a question. Yes, ma'am. Something like that, I answered again. Well, no alcohol for two days. No sex for a week. And please start wrapping it up. She explained as she handed me the free clinic care package of condoms, wipes, and the safe sex informational paperwork. I usually take it and give it away a little with it while I'm riding through the city. But I decided to keep it real with her for once in my life and give her something else to talk about with the nursing staff. So after I accepted the package, I quickly handed it right back to her. It ain't nothing I could do with them. My dick too big for the standard condom. I'm gonna need an XL or better for this cold motherfucker, I explained before getting up and making my way out of the clinic. When I got back to the car, the only thoughts going through my mind was how the fuck I got myself in this situation and how it would play out with Tiffany, Sierra, Tori, Lexi, and Jazz, the five women in my relationship rotation that I had been having unprotected sex with since my last visit to the clinic. Each one of them held a different spot in my heart of life for whatever reason it was that I chose to deal with them, but that didn't really matter. One of them had the dirty pussy STD, and more importantly, she had officially made me into the bad guy by giving it to me. Hey Siri, Play Mr. Hey Now, I said to my iPhone as I put my foot on the brake to push the button to start the Chrysler 300 that I happened to be in. So much in a rush to get to the free clinic as soon as it opened, I had completely forgot to get my daily dose of coffee in my system. My next stop was to the gas station to fill up my tank, get a cup of coffee with all the trimmings, some blunts, and a pack of Newport shorts in the box. I knew some bullshit was going to happen. As soon as I decided to focus on one thing, I said to myself as I made my way back home, but since there was nothing that I could do about it at the moment, I decided to keep my word to myself. Plus, I also knew that no matter what I said to who about what, that I was responsible for it. And might as well just take the blame and keep it pushing. The sound of Tiffany's voice as she ran down to me, her conversation with Jazz just kept playing in the back of my mind like it was on repeat or something. There was nothing that I could really say in response to it, so I just held the phone and listened to her talk. Tiffany played no games about her cooch, as she called it. And her concerns resonated with me because I felt the same way about my dick. 
pushing that old thought and conversation from my mind as I navigated through traffic, several other thoughts popped into my head. Because the look on the nurse's face when I told her that I told all parties involved in one way or another kept replaying in my mind, and I knew she probably wanted to know what I meant by it, but it wasn't any of her business. This how it played itself out. Tiffany called me to deliver the message that she got from Jazz. Sierra got a call for me to get the news, and Lexi and Tori both got a text from me. I could have explained that to her when she asked me about it, but that would have been giving out too much information for free that wasn't relevant to the situation. Plus, two days prior to getting that phone call, I had made up my mind to stop everything that I was doing to get my third book, Solitary Confinement, My Walls of Talk, published. And that was exactly what I planned to do. No Facebook, no YouTube, no Instagram, no Twitter, and most importantly, no useless phone conversations about anything that wasn't life-threatening or couldn't be changed no matter how I felt about it or the person trying to make contact. Tiffany was what I like to call my mediator girlfriend because of how she handled situations dealing with other women in my life. For some odd reason, she always went out of her way to smooth out situations that could become a problem for me in the future. Most times without me even knowing it, and that was the blessing that I loved her for. The fact that she was almost 5'11", the complexion of warm, caramel, and absolutely beautiful only added to my attraction to her. For my conversations and dealings, she was almost everything that I wanted in a woman. As far as I was concerned, she was something like my soulmate. But there was a catch that neither one of us could get past because Tiffany was in a relationship with someone other than me. Sierra was what I like to call my favorite girlfriend because that's what my other girlfriends referred to her as. She not only had a key to my residence, she also had no problem using it whenever she felt like it. She also cooked, cleaned, and made sure that I was generally okay on a daily basis, regardless if I reached out to her first or not, and that endeared her to my heart. The fact that she was 5'7", blessed with titties and ass to go with her pretty face and hot chocolate complexion only added to my attraction to her but her attitude always left something to be desired. Tori was what I like to call my stalker girlfriend because she was just that on every form of social media that I uploaded content to. She always made sure that she liked the post, left a comment, or sent me a message to let me know that she had seen it, and I loved that about her. The fact that she was 5'8", well-proportioned with an evenly brown complexion to go with her strong features made her easy to deal with. Her only flaw was the fact that she was super nosy and always had a question or two or ten that didn't have anything to do with her. But she lived out of town and I only had to deal with her when I felt like it. Lexi was what I like to call my bright idea girlfriend because she always had a bright idea for me to use to help my business. The fact that she was 5'6", petite frame, and light-skinned that made her attractive. But when you added the fact that her little brother was a famous rapper that made her gorgeous to me. I judge beauty different. And last but not least, jazz, or what I like to call my attention-seeking girlfriend. I say that because she caught my attention on Facebook one day with a can of whipped cream, and the rest is history. The fact that she was 5'9", light-skinned, and decent-looking all the way around the board made her easy on the eye. But when you added the fact that she was hungry for attention, a tad bit sexually free, and stayed in North Carolina, I got locked in with her faster than I should have. By the time I made it back to the house to finish what I set out to do, all three of my phones were going crazy with calls, texts, and social media notifications. They answered the phone, I thought to myself, as I sat in front of my computer to start the uploading process of my book, but decided against it as soon as the screen popped on and asked for my password. Fast forward. When I left the clinic this time, I went through the process of passing along the bad news and dealing with the consequences of my actions. Going through it the first time taught me so much about how to deal with it if it ever happened to me again, and I used that information to my advantage. Don't get me wrong, I still sent out a few texts, but most of them got a call from me. Don't judge me. The thought crossed my mind to keep it to myself, but I just couldn't. When the truth in the first case came to the light, Jazz was responsible for the outbreak, And though I didn't mention it then, this time around, I couldn't let it go. So much so that I spent the whole next day in the house tying up all the loose ends that I could while taking time out of my day to post the most direct, indirect stats about that experience. She had previously blocked me after the truth came out, but as soon as I brought it back to the surface, she popped back up. I'm not sure if it was the video I posted, 
or the when you break the silence about how bad all three hoes was, stat I posted that got her attention. But I know for a fact when I posted the, I shouldn't have never hit that dirty bitch from North Carolina. It wasn't even good, stat. It touched a nerve because not only did she report it, she also called me from a different number to try to talk about it. I had no interest in dealing with her ever again after the fake pregnancy move that she tried to pull on me. But I didn't have anything better to do while I was taking inventory. I had shirts, material, equipment, receipts, and all types of other things that I actually had to count. So I listened to her try to make amends for playing with my emotions while I cleared that end of the business. When I got it all done, the first thing that I did was block the numbers that she kept calling me from. I knew that I was wrong for giving her some form of false hope that I would allow her back into my life, but I kind of felt the same way when she had me thinking I might have my first child with her. And even though it didn't even out like it should, it did knock a major dent in the week that I was supposed to keep myself to myself, if you get what I'm saying. With only two days left, I spent them posting my most random real thoughts across all forms of my social media and dealing with the nonsense that they brought back to my life. Stat. I heard I'm being charged with domestic violence because I beat up her uterus. Response. Two inboxes, one phone call, and a text from a number that I had never seen before. Stat. Lawyer called. If they pressing charges, we countersuing for statutory because I'm eight, messing with a minor. Response. Three inboxes, four phone calls, and a DM on Instagram. Stat. Him. She won't even let me hit her with the thumb. Outer me. Damn, Brody. Inner me. She wouldn't let me take it out. Response. Six inboxes, two phone calls, and the woman who I was referring to popped up at my house to see if I had told her new boyfriend that I had already knocked her down. After she left disappointed that I wouldn't give her the business, I got off of social media and dealt with the missed phone calls and text messages concerning my real regular everyday life before taking a nap. Taylor still loved me. Kira still loved me. Amore still loved me. Keisha still had me on red. Destiny wouldn't stop calling me and everything was still right in my world. So after I woke back up, I fired back up and got right back to the random thoughts and the responses they brought me. Stat. I took penitentiary chances for people that won't even listen to my music, read my books, or support my t-shirt company. Response. Jackpot. Everything went off. I heard from people that I hadn't talked to in years. But not one to leave well enough alone, I kept the pressure going with the next one. Stat. If you're trying to fake a fallout with me before I leave St. Louis, speak now forever hold your peace. Response. Two offers to fight. An argument because she lived in a different city. Ten calls questioning if I was really serious about moving out of the city. And a special request for one of my hugs from her ex. Two blunts later, reality set in. And I got back to the business of things. My next stop put me outside of the city limits shooting footage for Attic. A poem from my second book, 142 Thoughts of a Convicted Felon. Chapter 10 I wonder what today gonna bring, I thought to myself as I smoked the blunt and finished getting myself together. It had been a breeze to keep myself to myself while I waited out the week. But as soon as I got the call that my dick was back in action, I didn't know what to do. I had turned down four different women during that time frame, and as I sat and thought about it, I got a tad bit perturbed in myself for getting me into that situation. I know you're probably confused as to where this is going, but luckily for you, the next thing that happened was the phone room. You have a collect call from an inmate at the Jefferson City Correctional Center, started the automated system. I wonder who this is, I thought to myself as I pressed one to accept the call. What's up, little cuz? Started the 15-minute timer and told me I was talking to my big cousin, Donnell Williams, 107-5841, who was serving a double life sentence for murder. I can't call it what's the word, big cuz, I shot back. You already know exactly what I'm going through behind these walls and fences, because you've been here before. What you got going on in the free world, though, he questioned. Taking a quick few minutes to run down what he had missed since our last conversation, he laughed the whole time. I couldn't even be mad at him about it either. His simple rationale of the situation summed it up in a way that only talking to a person with a life sentence could. He would trade any and everything that he had to be in my shoes, and I couldn't blame him one bit for it. So how's the book coming along? He cut back in after the customary 
This call is being monitored and recorded. Recording cut me off. I don't know yet, I responded. The month ain't over, but I am taking some good notes to make sure that I get it right. Boy, you a fool, he paused to say something to somebody in the background. So you really finna write a book about the last complete month you lived in St. Louis before you pack it up and get it out of there? Yup, I asked. Okay, I get that point. I even get the point about you trying to have a bed burning to release all the soul ties you had. If you believe in that nonsense, he started. It can't hurt because I cut in. That's fine and dandy. But the point that I can't wrap my mind around is the premise of how it's supposed to come together, he cut back in. Explain that to me like I'm a three-year-old. It's simple because I started before taking the last few minutes I called to break it down for him. When I got the idea to write the symbol, a story about burning my bed, it sounded good, but that wasn't good enough for me. In my mind, it needed something else to make it something that had never been done before, and that's where the premise came from, to only speak on the events or related events that seemed to come into my life without my assistance. I had so much that I wanted to talk about in my life, so many thoughts, opinions, and situations that I wanted to speak on. But unless it called me, I ran into it, or it happened without me being the one to initiate it, I had to keep it to myself. You have one minute. The recording cut in and cut me off again. Okay, look, cuz, you know what time it is. I can't wait to read this one when you finish with it. And just so you know, I got them pictures of your new chains and them motherfuckers hard. If you get the chance next time somebody daughter toot it up for you, make sure you have them motherfuckers on so you can add that to the story. I hope she a white girl. Thank you for using Securus. Cut in as the call ended. I can't wait until them people let my cousin out. I thought to myself as I made my way down the steps to go play in traffic for a few minutes. Being stuck in the house was driving me crazy, but I knew if I stayed to myself, I could keep myself to myself, if you get what I'm saying. Don't get me wrong. During my self-quarantine time, I stepped out to send out packages and collect paper, but that was it. No extracurricular activities. The only person that I seen that didn't have some money connected to it was Eddie Kane. And that was exactly where I ended up rolling a blunt and filling him in on what had or hadn't happened since the last time I was there. Randall. I know it may sound strange, but I knew that he probably already knew what I was going to say if he was watching over me. But I still told it to the dirt anyway. His patch of land was my conscience for the moment, and I didn't waste the opportunity to get whatever I had on my chest off of it. I was at the point of letting go of the idea of burning my bed due to lack of participation, and I can't tell you how much it hurt. Confession time. At some point, I know I already said this, but let me bring it back up so I can make it make sense. I have to be honest with you, though. I ain't been whole since I was a teenager. I can't tell you how many women I've had sex with in my lifetime. I can't even tell you how many women I've had sex with since I came home from prison this time. And I don't blame the weed. So you can only imagine the disappointment I was going through knowing that I wasn't going to be able to pull it off even though I plan to take it to the extreme. Like, really take it to the extreme. Like, really, really take it to the extreme. I'm talking buffet, bonfire, drinks, good gas, great company, and the chance to forever put to rest the theory of me having to type. It would have been the first of its kind, the first ever complete transparency of sexual partners where one bed is concerned The guest list was going to be amazing if you let me tell it. Friends, enemies, cousins, sisters, aunts, etc. Some by blood and some by marriage. Some at the top of the food chain and some at the bottom. And so many in between. And that ain't even the good part. I had been warned not to do it by more people than I could have mentioned. At a few different points, I had been downright threatened that bringing all those women together would result in a murder. And not just any murder. It had been flat out told to me if I did somehow make it happen, that would be the day I died. And the strangest part about it was that I welcomed it. I had it on my mind that dying in front of a live audience would be just a viral moment that I needed to bring some light and exposure to what I had going on. So much so that I even had my videography team leave that date open in their schedule just to make sure if I did pull it off, I lost my life in 4K. I even went so far as to make sure I had at least a thousand subscribers on my YouTube channel so I can ensure that I got paid from the views if I lived through it. It had been told to me that dying or going to jail was going to be the only way I ever got famous coming from where I'm from. 
and due to the fact I had already promised my mother that I wouldn't take any more penitentiary chances, that only left me with the other option. I know that may sound completely left field, but that's where I was with it. I had dropped three albums, a couple singles, released more videos than I could to think about I paid for, published three books, seen 40 other 50 states, stopped selling drugs and playing in the streets, opened my own business, started the Bacon MSP, and had my mother's funeral while she was still alive and enjoy it, and none of it worked. I had a few other things that I wanted to get off my chest, but I can't tell you about them. Some secrets are left for the dead, and that's where I'm going to leave it at. I wonder who that is, I thought to myself, as I seen the same car more than three times. That was a tell sign in my past life that I didn't need to be somewhere, and I followed it. Better safe than sorry. When I got back in traffic, I made sure that I took the long, long, long way home. And I did it at a very high rate of speed. It's the easiest way to know if somebody is following you. Don't ask me how I know. But I found out the hard way, and I don't want to discuss it. The only good thing about it was that I left my phones in the car while I was talking to Eddie Kane. I can't tell you how many messages and notifications I had missed while I was venting, but I can tell you that I had all the time in the world to deal with them as I made my way to the other side of the city. Halfway there, I had finished responding to everybody that had reached out to me while I had the world turned off, and nothing out of the ordinary was going on. The only thing that really caught my attention was that Tasha was headed to town for the holidays, but I pushed it from my mind just as fast. That was something that I may or may not have to deal with later on in life if I lived that long. So after making a mental note of it just in case I did, I called the weed man to see where he was at in the world. After stopping to pick up blunt cigarettes and something to drink, I pulled up in front of my building. Not in a rush to go in the house, I sat in the car and rolled up the last of my weed while listening to some of my new music and waiting on the weed man to pull up. Because for some odd reason, it always sounded better in the car. I never understood why, though. But since I couldn't argue the fact, I turned it up and listened for anything that I might want to change or do over on the final mix down. When the weed man pulled up to get me together, it hurt my soul that I had to literally pay regular prices for my pressure. That was one of the perks of hustling that I missed more than anything else. But I handed my money over, took my bag, and went in the house pouting. There was nothing that I could do about it given my present situation, and I took it for what it was without putting too much thought into it. I hate my life, I said to myself, as I thought about the fact that I couldn't call, text, or randomly ask somebody's daughter to come let me give her the business. That was the main premise, and I refused to go against it because it would take away from the authenticity. It didn't matter that I wanted to enjoy the pleasures of losing myself inside of her most precious gift. That was meaningless. It was also the main reason I was standing in my kitchen smoking a blunt as I argued with myself about breaking down and sending out an SOS text to get my dick sucked. The thought crossed my mind to actually do it, but I decided against it. Talking to my cousin early in the day and telling him about the book again was the second thing that popped into my head while I was thinking it over, and I didn't want to have to tell him that I went against the grain for my own personal lust. I knew that he would never let me live it down, and I couldn't take the chance. When I had more than enough smoke for my lungs, I went back in my bedroom to play the game and finish the night out. The thought of enjoying somebody's daughter was quickly leaving my mind until I thought about the last words that my cousin said before I called in. I hope she a white girl played out of my mind in his voice, and strangely, my phone dinged at that exact moment. W.Y.D. read the inbox from Storm. The thought actually crossed my mind and ignored it, but I didn't. One part of me wanted to leave well enough alone for the evening, but the other side of me decided to continue playing along with whatever came into my life. At the crib chilling, I responded silently, praying that she didn't respond as I went back to playing Call of Duty. Ten kids later, my phone dinged again, and I can't say what my mood was as I read the message. Let me suck your dick for a little while, she questioned. What you do now, day? I asked myself as I looked from my phone to the television and back at the phone. The last time I seen Storm, she did exactly what her message said she would do, and I didn't know how to take it. I wanted to leave her message on red and not respond, but thoughts of telling my cousin that he actually got his wish proved to be more enticing than not. Confession. As I worded my response to her offer, two things crossed my mind. The first being that I knew her boyfriend that happened to be locked up by high-speeding in a too-slow car. 
And the second was that she would make her way into this book, and I did not want to hear about it later on when it came out. After taking a few minutes to fire up and think over my choices, I accepted her invite and decided to take all of the ridicule that came with it. Rose gonna kill you for real. I thought to myself as I walked down the steps to open the door. Backstory. I can't remember exactly where I messed on, but I know for a fact that it came from some part of my social media when I was trying to be a rapper. She seen me through somebody that knew somebody that knew somebody that knew me in real life, and she followed me everywhere. It started with a comment here and a share there, then it grew. Being that social media actually contributed to my income, I literally paid attention to it. And that was just the beginning. She popped up at a show here and a show there, and she always showed love wearing the logo and everything. I had so much going on at the time, I paid her advances no mind, but she kept shooting her shot. I can't say how many times she reached out to me during fucking hours, only for me not to respond back. Rejection after rejection, but she stayed with it. When she questioned what I had against white girls in a longer, drawn-out inbox, that was the message that finally caught my attention. I wanted to tell her the whole truth, but I didn't. It was none of her business, and I kept it like that. I wasn't about to break the jail code when she knew the words to the song. I also think it was the tipping point in my decision to finally give her the dick, and I was not disappointed with my decision. I mean, not at all. Storm stood a little over 5'3 and was white girl thick, like wide hips, big breasts, no stomach, and no ass unless the jeans fit right or is bent over correctly. I don't really have a better explanation. Well, yes, I do, but it's going to really sound racist. But I swear for Lord that is not the case. And before I tell you that my Aunt Steph was a white girl and she was my mother's best friend my whole life, and make it sound even more racist? Please just know that my Aunt Steph grew weed, did two prison sentences, and had a talking Scarlett McCall named Charlie that was only afraid of the oven in real life. But stereotypes are real. I would be a hypocrite if I acted differently. The only difference is some of mine's are a two-way street. Key word, mine's. Example, all black people do not look alike. But I don't care what nobody in the world say. All white people fit the same hue description. Example, all black men are well endowed. And if I'm the case subject, I am in complete agreement with that. And I promise no woman, past, present, or future, will ever dispute it. I can go on and on about it and give you example after example, but I'm not. The only other stereotype that is important at this point in time is the one that I made up myself about white girls from reading so many dirty stories in pornography magazines while I was doing time. In my mind, white women were nasty, nasty in the bedroom and wanted to be taken and controlled by a smooth, brown-skinned mandingo. Luckily, I fit all of that. Tattoos, muscles, in shape, and whatever else she might want from me. And even luckier for me, Storm fit right into my stereotype also, and she let me have my way with her. I mean, like, really have my way with her. She actually told me that she was a fan and didn't care what I did to her, just so she could know I did it. And I promise I put that theory to the test. Gaping, ass to mouth head, choking, dick slapping, and all that. The only thing I didn't try that I read in a book, watched on a porn, or just wanted to try was to spit in her mouth because that was just going a little overboard. I do have my limits, but I did take all night to do it. And just between me and you, it ended with a great anal cream pie. And the only thing I had on was my chains, Free Lil' D. Chapter 11. I wonder how this finna turn out. I thought to myself as I read the text that Tasha was pulling up. The last time I seen her, I was putting out my last book, and she got to see the complete process while looking over my shoulder because she had decided to lock in with me until I got it done. I completely turned off the world during that time frame, and her front row seat asked her so many questions about me that she never took the time to ask. We almost ended up falling out behind it because she didn't know how to keep what she seen happen in my life to herself, but I let it slide because love trumps stupidity most of the time. 
Plus, my ex had a way of seeming to know things that she really had no idea about. If you talked to her long enough, something would slip if you didn't know any better. I faulted her for it out of the gate. But after putting a lot of thought into it and who she was dealing with, we had a very long discussion to ensure no more of my random business got passed along to anybody. It didn't matter who it was. Friends, family, whoever I might be fucking at the time, or anybody else that fit or didn't fit into those categories. Hi, day, she greeted me after I opened the door. Hey now, Tasha. I shot back as I grabbed one of her bags to help. The thought crossed my mind to ask her how she got to my house, but I kept it to myself. Old habits were extremely hard to break, but every time I didn't ask the question, I felt like I was making progress. It didn't take long at all for her to make herself at home, and I didn't have a problem with it. As a matter of fact, it didn't bother me at all. And I was actually appreciative that I had somebody in the house other than myself that knew how to roll a blunt. But I kept that to myself also. I know somebody is wondering who Tasha is by now, so let me fill in the blanks. I met Tasha when I was still hustling. And though she has never said it to me out loud, I am almost certain that she fell in love with me on one of our first three encounters. Though I have nothing against small women, she fit the description to a T. Almost five feet, under 110 pounds, with the bra and jean size to match. She also had the Napoleon complex to go along with it, and a very irritating voice to top it all off. But after I got used to all of the things about her that I didn't like, she was somebody that I didn't mind being around me. I'm not going to waste your time giving you the full backstory on how we met, but I will say that she made the transition out of the street life with me, and I loved her for it no matter what she did. Add to that the fact that she loved Edna Jean wholeheartedly, and there you have it. Being that it was December 24th, or what most people identify as Christmas Eve, after we finished smoking one, she was making plans for the night that did not include me. I stopped indulging in other people's holidays stuck in the cell in some part of the state, and I hadn't gotten back into the routine of things upon my release. Either time. Random. I went to prison in 1997. And that Christmas bag that the Department of Corrections gave out every year got smaller and smaller until I came home in 2010. It was even smaller when I went back in 2013 and even smaller than that when I came home in 2016. I'm not going to use that as the reason I don't celebrate, but it will definitely come up in the argument, along with a few other key points on both sides that just didn't sit right with me when I did my research on it. As a matter of fact, on most holidays, it was either a massacre or a war related to them. And that was all that I needed to know to pick my side and stay on it. Don't get me wrong. I can't, will not, nor will I ever try to change somebody's mind on the subject either. I am completely responsible for myself, and I act accordingly in every situation. I can't tell no man, woman, or child who to believe in what to give thanks for, where they come from, when to be happy, or why to do or not to do anything else they might do. But when the coin gets flipped over, please don't judge me for demanding the same respect. Not long after she left to get the festivities of her night start in my phone room. No need to mention who it was. But what is important is when it was over with, it prompted me to pop up on my Facebook Live completely confused and befuddled. It's hard to understand and deal with people who don't understand the flaw in their ways when it's pointed out to them. That call proved it beyond a shadow of a doubt. But let me explain where I'm coming from. What's the word, love? I answered the phone. What you doing, Day? She questioned. Not having anything going on because of my situation, I played it out for her right quick without putting too much on it. Tasha being in town and staying with me was not any of her business, so I kept it to myself. What I had planned for later on in the day was always up in the earth for me, so I had no answer there that made any sense either. But she questioned it anyway. Then the conversation took a turn to the freaky side. I knew I shouldn't have ate her ass, I thought to myself, but she brought it back to my attention. I'm guessing it was her first time. And from the looks of things, as the conversation continued, her sole purpose for rigging my phone was to set up a repeat performance. I wanted to cut her off and question why she was beating around the bush with it. But I didn't. I questioned what she had been doing since the last time we spoke instead, and that was the beginning of the end. 
Now that I'm done with all my Christmas shopping, I was trying to come lay up with your nasty ass for a little while, she asked. What you get me? I shot back. Nothing, she paused. You don't even celebrate. You don't remember you didn't even come get a plate for Thanksgiving. So who all you buy gifts for, I questioned, extremely interested in her answer. The family, a few friends, the secret Santa shit at my job, and dude, she responded, dude being her boyfriend. The thought crossed my mind to let it go, but I just couldn't help myself. I had already told her about being a hypocrite on more than one occasion, but the conversations always ended with us agreeing to disagree on the subject. But not this time. I knew I had her right where she needed to be for my logic to make complete sense to her, so I wasted no time beating around the bush and went straight in for the kill shot. Hold on. I paused, more for effect than anything else. So you telling me you bought gifts for a few of your friends, the secret Santa, and dude, and you didn't give me nothing? Another pause again just for effect. So who you love more than me? Not to mention I know all of her family, most of her friends, a couple people at her job, and dude in real life. Up until that point, I thought she loved me more than several people on that list, and not just because I thought it, but because she actually said it. But that's neither her nor there. I wonder why this pause taking so long, I thought to myself, as it seemed like I was just holding the phone for no reason. It was so long, I actually looked at it to make sure it was still somebody on it. When she finally did respond to my accusation, she agreed that she loved me more than a few people on that list, but still didn't understand where I was going with it. It actually irked my soul for a split second, so much so that I had to bite my tongue in my response. So, I paused not to call out her name. I wanted to call her a bitch, but I didn't. You bought so-and-so. No need to add a name, a gift. But I can't get nothing because I don't celebrate it. But on the flip side of the coin, you do. And if I don't, that shouldn't matter because you do. And I had the audacity to not only not buy me some, but to want this work speaks volumes as to who you are as a person. And I don't do that fake shit, not at all. I finished and hung up the phone. By the time I got off alive, I was still confused. But it didn't matter. That had been the story of my life for years where holidays were concerned, and I played along with it. There was nothing that I could do about it anyway, and I did my best to act like it. To be completely honest, I wasn't in the mood to deal with her in the first place, and calling her on some real shit was the easiest way that I knew to not have to be bothered. It worked nine out of ten times, and I was thankful that that was one of them as I turned the game on and turned my phones off. You can't imagine how I felt to wake up on Christmas and it was a Tuesday. It was the weirdest feeling ever, but I had to deal with it. I was literally celebrating my holiday on a fake holiday and all the nonsense that came with it. I thought about leaving my phones off and ignoring the world for the day, but I knew that that was not going to work out in my favor. I had a house guest in from out of town, a business to run, and promotion to do whether I felt like it or not. I'm so tired of this shit, I thought to myself as I looked through my messages, which happened to contain more holiday gifts and well wishes for something that I had no interest in in my life. The follower's mentality goes a long way in that respect. So after I got over it, I actually made one of my own that came with a link to one of my videos and everything. I have never been one of those people that believed in chain mail, but if it worked, I wouldn't have been mad. And I made sure that that was my response to everyone I received. When Tasha pulled up, she only stayed long enough to smoke, change clothes, and question me about my friends and family, or lack thereof. I couldn't be mad at her for wanting to see me spend quality time with someone other than myself, but there was nothing I can do about it. I wanted to tell her that I didn't talk to nobody in my family, but she already knew that. I wanted to tell her that I left all my friends in the streets when I got out of them, but she already knew that too. My life was an open book to her, so I didn't waste none of my time or oxygen to tell her something that she already knew before asking. It seemed extremely uncalled for, and when her ride pulled up, I can't even say I was mad she left. Not halfway through the second cup of the day, Vixen called to see if I was working. I wanted to tell her it was the best gift ever, but decided against it. 
I wonder what she got up her sleeve this time. I thought to myself while well, I turned on all my equipment and finished my coffee. The last time I seen Vixen, she was working on her custom t-shirt line, properly named The Petty Collection, which included the Super Petty, Petty Cola, Petty Crocker, and beautiful black and petty as fuck designs, because that was a wonderful way to describe her. By the time the heat press signaled it was ready to go, she was knocking on my door. It had been said that you could get anywhere in St. Louis in 15 minutes, so it didn't surprise me at all that she was on the other side of the city when she made the call. What can I do for you today, I inquired as I sat down in the captain's seat in front of my computer. I'm not here for me this time, she shot back. The thought crossed my mind to question it, but before I could get the words to come out of my mouth, she continued, I'm here for my sister. I need a black medium with the design I'm sending to your email in red and green, she explained. Random. Her mouth looked so good with her lip gloss popping that I had an extremely inappropriate thought about grabbing her by the back of her head, but I kept that to myself also. When I finally pulled up the image, it said FTK. Fuck them kids. And I couldn't do nothing but laugh. I had previously assumed that she wasn't the only petty person in her family, but that proved it. It also gave me something great to post when I finished with it, and that didn't take no time. Just to make it even more comical, the whole time I was making it happen, I kept mentioning it so I could hear Vixen keep saying, fuck them kids. So much so that I brought it back up while shooting a promo clip, and you can literally hear her saying it on my post. It worked out perfect for both of us because neither one of us biologically had any kids to say fuck. And on top of it all, I got paid to do it. After I got her purchase bagged up, she was on her way. And I was back to dealing with the nonsense that comes with social media and holidays. You couldn't imagine how many people sent well wishes and questioned why I wasn't with family. But I paid it no mind. I just made sure that I sent back my own message in return. The thought crossed my mind to go on one of my social media rants about not wanting to hear, receive, read, acknowledge, put thought into, or even deal with family and friends on a day I was only celebrating because it was Tuesday. I'm responding to this, I said to myself as I sat back down in front of my computer. The lady actually sent me a message that said, I don't mean to be all in your business, but I follow you and never hear you speak about family. Why you don't do family like that? I could have gave her the longer, drawn-out version in the message, but I didn't. It only took less than a minute to copy and paste her question as a caption, add a me, and attach the video for my song, Forgive Me, then move on for a few minutes until the responses started coming in. I spent the rest of the day smoking and posting. When I woke up the next morning, my first post spoke volume. My last Christmas in St. Louis went just like I thought it would. It didn't take long to get a few messages about that stat, and that motivated me to post the next one. Her, you not going to come see me before you leave? Me, I ain't seen you since I came home the first time. No reason in changing a good thing, ain't it? No need to tell you how left that went with several people in my life, but it carried over into the next day. I can't say who wholeheartedly believed I was moving away, but the message I received before I came outside to run around told me a lot. It said so much that I ended up going live to speak on it. No need to bore you with the whole 10 minutes, but I will almost verbatim the last 30 seconds because they shall apply forever with me and they everybody that deals with me. If it's going to make you mad that you text me and I don't respond, stop texting me. If it's going to make you mad that you message me and it takes me a day or two to get back to your message. Stop messaging me. If you mad that you call me and I don't answer my phone, then stop calling. It's just that simple. But if you for me, then you already know that when I get around to dealing with it, I'ma holler at you. The thought actually applied before I said it, but that was on some street shit. It applied after I said it. Even more because I wouldn't be able to tell you this story if I didn't give it all my attention. Speaking of attention, Tasha had been in and out for the last couple of days she had been in town. And it was what it was. Don't get me wrong. I could tell you about how that played itself out. But I'm not. If you're wondering was there any sex involved during that time, the answer is yes. That would probably be the only word that I could use to describe it. I can't call it fucking 
because that's not what happened. I can't call it making love either because that's not what happened. I have only tried to enjoy her pleasures in private parts on four occasions during the years that we have known each other, and I have the greatest reason ever for it. I know you want to know, don't you? Tell the truth. You really want to know, don't you? Confession time. There are several women from my past that I have had sex with that I didn't enjoy. Even more if you count the runners, but that's another story. But where these women are concerned, I can't say that the pussy was trash or that she didn't know what she was doing or whatever other good reason I can come up with to describe it. That's not the case. The issue with those women was the same one that I had with Tasha. She would give it to me, but she wouldn't give it to me. If you know what I'm saying, men should understand if you had endured it, and women shall relate if they have done it. But to me, it's one of the weirdest things ever, and I just don't understand it. What makes it even more interesting is the fact that I am an inquisitive person and always want to know what the problem is and how I can fix it. I could run you through a list of reasons that I received for it, but some of those secrets are safe with me. Others are not, but that's another story, also for another day. Let me finish this one. Not one to leave well enough alone. I questioned her about her reasoning for not letting me completely enjoy her all the way up until December 30th when she finally decided she was going back to Texas. Her rationale for giving but not giving, if you get what I'm saying, was because, and I quote, I'm not finna let you run me down a rabbit hole knowing I can't have you the way I want you. You know how good that dick is? You is not finna drive me crazy with your nasty ass. I will go to jail fucking with you. Chapter 12 New Year's Eve didn't really feel special when I woke up. Nothing in my life was really gonna change in the next 24 hours. And I stopped making resolutions when I figured out that my word really meant something to me. Not even in the mood to slide into my morning Facebook Live video. I popped in already in the process of making the first cup of the day. I was kind of in my body about it. But I was working on letting go of the past. I was also working on getting rid of everything that I didn't want or need even more. So that's kind of the direction my conversation went in. Coffee cups, clothes, merchandise, or whatever else probably couldn't fit in the suburban I had reserved to make the trip. But I can't lie. The whole time I was going back and forth with the internet, my mind was somewhere else. I actually went to jail on New Year's Day for high speeding from them people. It made the news and everything. I didn't see the streets again for another three years, six months, and 23 days. It was truly bittersweet in more ways than you can imagine. But on the back end, every time somebody brought it up, that's where my mind went. I stayed live for my usual hour, but when I got off of it, Reality really set in. Self-evaluation moment. I had completely come to grips with the fact that there wouldn't be a murder connected to my bed burning, and that left me in a weird place. Add to that the fact that my lease was up in 20 days. I hadn't completely decided where I was moving to, and everything else in my life was up in the earth. I was so thankful that the weed man delivered, I didn't know what to do. Two blunts into my purchase, my mind leveled out on enjoying the moment and some money called. It always amazed me the shirt ideas that I would get, but the ones that came from the plus-size women always went above and beyond. Their creativity in those areas kind of made up for the places they lacked, and I ended up having a great conversation about nothing while I got the order done. It was actually just what I needed to get the day all the way started, and things picked up from there. That order brought another one. And another one. And another one. And after posting a couple more pictures just because I didn't have anything else better to do, it brought another one. By the time I actually got outside to see what the day would really bring me, it was a little after 4 p.m. The only reason I really know was because as soon as I hopped in the car, I got tagged in the stat by Blanco Tarantino TV, the biggest blogger in St. Louis. And it threw me for a loop for a split second. So much so that I sat in the car for a few minutes looking at it before I even responded to it. Stat. My favorite artist is Damon L.L.E.J.S. Smith. 
blood, sweat, and tears in his lyrics. Y'all wouldn't understand. Response. They will, though. My next stop was to the gas station to get blunts, gum, and cigarettes. The next thing on the agenda was food. The thought crossed my mind to try something different. But I was so lost in thought that I ended up calling in comfort food and watching the sunset smoking the blunt and talking to Eddie K. I had so much to say on the front end, but on the back I wasn't talking about anything. I didn't have anything to talk about. I had books out, but they were only selling because I was selling them. I had music out, but you wouldn't know it from the views and streams. Fresh Out ENT of Pearl was the only part of my company bringing in any real, real money, and it wasn't my turn anymore to carry the pig around. Plus, I was still stuck in the city for a few more weeks, hoping the past didn't catch up with me, because conveniently, my lease ended the same day I was scheduled to file my taxes, and that was the last thing I needed to do before I left. I wonder who that is, I thought to myself as my phone vibrated in my pocket. The thought crossed my mind to ignore it, but I didn't follow it. What I did was finish smoking my blunt and talking to myself. When that was over with, it didn't surprise me at all that Zen wanted to see me. She was big on actually seeing the people that she was taking into the new year with her, and I could knock her ideology. It made so much sense that that was the only reason I decided to leave the cemetery. By the time I made it to the house, she was already there. I'm so glad she got a key, I thought to myself as I watched her coming up the steps. If my security camera could only talk. Random. After I gave up on the thought of making an event out of burning my bed, I had another idea. No need to go into full details, but it boiled down a leak in the black book. It rolled around in my head over and over again until I was almost to the point to put it to the test. The only thing that stopped me was the fact that I knew that I would be going against everything that I stood for in the hopes to garner some attention. And that was just on the front end. On the back end, I had it on my mind that I would be signing my own death certificate by doing so. But it did cross my mind. And to make it even better, I actually had the security camera footage to prove it. Confession. I have been called a lot of things in my life for doing some of the things that I have done. But I refused to deal with the repercussions of following that thought to where it was going to lead me. My black book contained names, dates, times, and the connection I had with the name in question. Example, so-and-so, July 6, 11.30 p.m., who happened to be so-and-so, little sister. Another example, whatchamacallit, August 11, 9.30 a.m., dude I was locked up with, wife, and so on and so forth. I had a few names in particular that I had given my word that I would take what happened between us to my grave. And as bad as I wanted to go against it, I planned to keep it. But it did cross my mind. Like, really cross my mind, cross my mind. The thought also crossed my mind to run that same thought past Zen when I pulled up to the house. But once I walked into her wonderful embrace, it faded from my mind. She had once told me that I may not never get where I'm trying to go. It don't matter what I do or what I don't do. If it's not for me, then it's not for me. The craziest part about it was that she said it with the straightest face I have ever seen. It had so much conviction and sincerity behind it, I almost believed it. Almost. I can't say how long that hug lasted, but when we finally parted, I got my three kisses and was quickly informed that she needed a shirt to wear to a New Year's party. And not just any shirt. She needed something that completely fit who she was as a person. The thought crossed my mind that questioned exactly what she meant by that, but I kept it to myself. I had walked down that road on more than one occasion, and I had no interest in taking the trip again. It never turned out the way that I wanted it to, and after trying enough times, I had come to grips with that. Plus, I already had something in mind that I wanted to give her in the first place, so it worked out perfect in the end. She loved Marilyn Monroe for whatever reason she had, and I had just come into possession of several different quick press patterns with her likeness on them, gifts from my fat partner. So it only took 15 minutes to get her together and on her way. 
and that worked out perfectly in her schedule to go home and get dressed before the evening's festivities. What you gonna do now, Day? I thought to myself as I watched her leave. I didn't have anything planned, nor was I trying to, because I no longer ran the streets armed and dangerous. They started shooting as soon as the sun started going down, and that was a recipe for destruction that I wanted no parts of. The younger stupid me? Yes. The older still playing in the streets me? Yes. But the I don't live that lifestyle no more me? No. That me humbly declined every invite that came my way that would put me, a convicted felon, in the presence of an unregistered firearm. I know I said this before, but let me say it again so it really makes sense. I can't tell you how many people that I love with my whole heart that I no longer talk to. How many places that I enjoy going that I no longer visit. And even though that is not the way that I wanted it, that is the way that it has to be. When you understand the consequences of your actions, you understand the consequences of the actions of the people that you be around also. And I had no intentions of being a part of somebody's indictment just because I love them. Don't get me wrong, though. The thought crossed my mind to chance it, but it died just as fast as I fired up. My phone run three good puffs into it, and I couldn't be mad about it. I met B after he started the three-level security company, and for some odd reason, I had become the last-minute shirt connect for the new guys added to his crew. And it didn't surprise me at all that he had work lined up for the night and needed a few shirts for the job, but I kept it to myself. What did surprise me, though, was the fact that he was at my door as soon as I let him know I was still open for business. It threw me off for a split second. But I kept it to myself. Old habits are extremely hard to break, but every time I didn't ask the question, I felt like I was making progress. Talking to B was always a pleasure, and always the reason I never charged him full price. It didn't matter what he wanted, or how fast he wanted it. I had it in my mind after several long and drawn out conversations that I would be doing everything in my power to need his services one day. And I wanted to make sure that I got all the bells and whistles for a nice discount. This meeting of the minds was no different. He needed a few shirts for a few new recruits to his team, and I was with it. I was also with the good conversation. It was not often I got to chit-chat with another business owner building a brand from the ground up. My mother always told me that my friends would never be my fans. It made all the sense in the world to me, and even more to him. It did take a few seconds for the simplicity of it to register, though. But once it did, it completely answered the question of why his friends and family were not pushing and promoting his business the way he thought they should. I had the same thoughts when my business was concerned and was dealing with them same emotions. To be completely honest, I told him what my mother said more telling it to myself. It was also a great point to take a break in the conversation to check phones and send out messages while the realness of the moment settled. I had several messages, but the only one that really stood out to me was from Deshae. Random. People always ask me who took the picture of me naked on my beanbag covered in all my books, and I never answered. Well, the truth is, I had that picture taken the last time I seen Deshae, and to be even more truthful, she took one of her own in an extremely compromising position with all of them on her back. It was one of the prettiest pictures I have ever taken and nobody will ever get to see. But that's neither here nor there. What is important is after I let her know where I was and what I was doing, she pulled up. I wish I could tell you that the conversation continued in the business direction that it started in, but that would not be the case. I forgot to mention that Deshae was a stand-up comedian in her spare time, so she came right through the door with jokes. You should have seen the look on B's face when she told him that she would eat him up. It was priceless. And it wasn't really what she said that caught him off guard, but more the placement and timing of how she said it. I know I mentioned previously that I didn't have a problem with small women because that is exactly the category that Deshae fit in. So you can only imagine what it looked like with her standing toe-to-toe -to -toe with B talking shit. Him at 6'5", 280, solid. And her at 5'2", 125, wet with rocks in her pocket. 
she literally looked like a little kid standing in front of him. And people wonder why I don't watch TV. My real life is a movie, and I got the best show ever watching them go back and forth while I finish his order. Not to mention the whole time one of B's employees was standing off to the side enjoying the show with me. The thought actually crossed my mind to take my time, but I didn't. Time is money for anybody running a business, and I knew for a fact that B had something else paying planned for the evening because he was looking at me. After I got him out of the way, took pictures to post, and told them to be safe, I finally got the chance to ask to say why I hadn't seen her. And it didn't surprise me at all that her new job had been taking up all of her time. Whatever company she worked for offered unlimited overtime, and she was taking full advantage of it. It made all the sense in the world to me from that perspective, but I still acted like she had been neglecting me for doing it. Her response went straight to the jokes, and after watching how she handled B, I wanted no parts of that action. I wonder how long this finna last. I thought to myself as she heated up right fast, telling me all about myself. Nothing disrespectful. But she followed me on all forms of social media, so she had all kinds of ammunition to use. And let me be the one to tell you, she used it. I keep saying that I have been talked to any type of way by more women than I could have remember. Add the shade to the list. When the jokes ended, the semi-serious question started. When was I leaving? Where was I going? Did I plan on coming back? And so on and so forth. The thought crossed my mind to lie about it, but there was no need to. I was leaving after my lease ended and I filed my taxes. Simple. I was going somewhere where weed was legal, but I hadn't made up my mind yet on where that would be. Colorado, California, or Washington. And due to the fact that I hadn't actually did the numbers yet on which one would be the best move for me, I really didn't have an answer there. Well, I did, but that's another story. You still ain't answer my question, Day. She cut in after I tried to stir the conversation back on her. What question? I shot back with the I'm super confused look. They stopped playing with me. I asked you, are you coming back after you leave? She paused to make the weirdest little face as she rolled her eyes. Don't tell me I might not never see you again. Those words were followed by an extremely uncomfortable silence while I thought about how to respond to what she said. I wanted to tell her the complete truth, but I didn't. There was no reason in speaking on something that had yet to happen, and that's where I left it at, up in the earth. The truth of the matter was, I had seen so many people move from the city saying that they would never come back, be gone six months to a year, then be right back with the dick look. My word meant everything to me, so instead of saying something that I might have to stand on, right, wrong, or indifferent, I kept it to myself. Emotionally transparent confession. I wanted to tell her, fuck no, nah, I wasn't coming back. Fuck St. Louis and most of the people in it. But I didn't, like I said, I kept it to myself. My mother at once told me that my friends would never be my fans. People that knew me in real life would never be in awe of me because they seen me do what I be doing all the time. And she never lied. The craziest part about that, though, and what made the statement hurt so much more, was that between me and her, I literally knew half of the city in real life. I hate to be cliche, but Kane said it best. I had done too much to turn back, and I had done too much to go on. But in my case, it was literal. My past life was a real movie that you didn't get up from when you died. Nobody ever said cut. The camera stayed rolling, and whatever happened, happened. St. Louis, Missouri is not the place to play in the streets then have a change of heart. Grudges never die. Revenge lasts a lifetime, and the consequences of your actions may not present themselves immediately. And though I won't tell a soul some of the things that have happened in my life, I will say that I wake up every morning super excited that not only am I alive, but more importantly that I'm free. Don't get me wrong, though. Leaving it up in the earth with the shade did not work out like it was supposed to. Because as soon as I tried to change the subject, she changed it back. The thought ran through my mind to sugarcoat an answer for her, but it didn't last long. 
She was child-sized and child-persistent in getting the response out of me that she could understand. And after thinking about it for a few seconds, I decided to give her the realest answer I could come up with. You want to know if I'm coming back, love? I questioned after she started asking me over and over and over and over and over again. Tell me, tell me, tell me, she pleaded. Baby, I'd be a damn fool to stick around a place I did so much dirt to give one of these hating-ass niggas a chance to get they lick back. I refused to go out like that. Now you tell me if I'm coming back. I finished and waited for her response. It didn't surprise me at all that it didn't come. What did catch me off guard was after how her mind processed my answer. She grabbed a dick and massaged it through my gray sweatpants until it started getting hard. What you doing, lady? I paused to look down at her. You ain't answered my question yet. She looked up at me for a split second, then looked back down at the bulge that was growing right in front of her eyes. I thought she was about to say something in response, but she didn't. She continued rubbing and pulling on me until I heard the weirdest notification sound ever. I wanted to question what it was, but she spoke before I could get the words out of my mouth. That's that overtime I've been waiting on. She paused to pull my dick out. I just came for this. She finished before puckering up and giving the head the sweetest little kiss. Then she raised up and left. I'm going to sleep, I said to myself as I heard the door close. Ain't nobody going to believe you, day.